Technology. I want to welcome you to our hearing this morning. We are pleased to be joined today by the Committee on Housing and Buildings, uh, chaired by Council Member Cornegie, who should be here in a few minutes, and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, chaired by Council Member Espinel. Uh, today we will focus on the use of facial recognition technology and biometric data collection in business and residences in New York City. The hearing will also focus on the following three bills. Intro 1170, sponsored by Council Member Torres, would require businesses to notify customers of the use of biometric identifying technology. Intro 1672, sponsored by Council Member Richards, would require real property owners to submit registration statements regarding biometric recognition technology utilized on the premises. Uh, Pre-considered intro, the numbers pending, sponsored by Council Member Lander, would define the term key uh, in the New York City Building Code and require building owners to provide keys to residential tenants. New York City has seen an increased use of facial recognition technology in residential buildings and businesses. This game-changing technology has the ability to improve security yet affects privacy. Unlike other biometric identifiers like fingerprints, facial recognition technology can operate at a distance and without anyone's knowledge or consent. In New York City, cameras are everywhere, as we know, in retail stores, restaurants, on street corners, attached to buildings or vehicles, and more. In the private sector, facial recognition technology can identify customers, prevent shoplifting, and strengthen security among others. However, there is a little to no knowledge, there is little to no, uh, little or no knowledge of how data generated from facial recognition technology is collected, stored, and shared. With this technology, there is a potential for data breaches that could result in grave consequences for those affected. After all, if a password gets hacked, it can easily be changed. However, one's face is unique and irreplaceable. Today, we will focus on the implementation of facial, facial recognition technology in the private sector and how to balance the benefits of this technology. Even with strengthened, secu strengthened security and improved consumer experiences, the risk of data breaches and invasions of privacy pose serious concerns. We look forward to gaining a better understanding of facial recognition technology and its uses in our city. We hope to work together with the administration in mitigating any negative impacts on our communities and finding solutions. Today, we will hear testimony from the administration, industry experts, and community advocates. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize my colleagues, Councilman Lander, uh, Council Member Koo, uh, Council Member Ayelis, Ayelis here, yes. Um, Council Member is Jaeger? Jaeger, not Jaeger, okay. Uh, Council Member, Powers, who else? Council Member Cabrera, did I say Council Member Richards, and Grudenchek, Council Member Grudenchek, and who, okay. Oh, Council Member Lewis, sorry. I would like to acknowledge the staff of, of the Committee on Technology, uh, Council Irene Bohofsky, Policy Analyst Charles Kim, and Finance Analyst Sebastian Baki. I'd also like to thank my own staff, Daniel Krasina, and Communications Director Ryan Kelly for their valu valuable assistance in preparation for today's hearing. Uh, I'd like to turn over uh, the, uh, my co-chair for today is uh, Councilman Espinal. For the thank you, Mr. Business. Chairman. Good morning, my name is Rafael Espinal and I am the chair on the Committee of uh, Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I want to thank the chair of the Technology Committee, Councilmember Bob Holden, and the chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee, Councilmember Cornegie, for convening this important hearing today. In today's joint hearing, we will hear testimony on the issue of facial recognition technology and how it is used in commercial establishments and residential housing. As the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee, I am deeply invested in ensuring that New York City's customers have honest, transparent, and fair transactions with retailers and establishments. Developments in facial recognition and other biometric technology pose new consumer protection challenges in an atmosphere where there's already growing concerns privacy, of privacy and personal data. While this technology has the potential to be utilized in a number of positive ways, there are several valid concerns that need to be addressed. 
For example, at the moment, businesses are not required to inform customers that their biometric information, such as a face or fingerprint scan, is being collected by the store or establishment they are in. Customers are also left in the dark about what happens to this information once the customer finalizes their transaction. As is highlighted in the committee report, facial recognition technology is a highly imperfect and tends to misidentify people of color at very high rates. We have also heard that companies developing this type of software sometimes resort to shady or deceitful tactics to expand their databases or improve their product. Just last week, we heard that in Atlanta, Google was hiring contractors to deliberately target people of color, encouraging them to scan their faces in exchange for a $5 gift card so that it can improve its new Pixel device. According to the New York Daily News reporting of this practice, the contractors were told to go after people of color, conceal the fact that people's faces were being recorded, and even lie to maximize their data collections. It was even suggested that, that the contractors described their face scan as a kind of selfie game, similar to Snapchat. These kinds of deceptive practices are simply not acceptable. That's why I have co-sponsored Councilmember Torres' bill, intro 1170, that would require businesses to notify customers if they are collecting biometric information of customers in their stores and let them know how long the data will be retained and whether it will be shared with a third party. We certainly do not want to stand in the way of technological advancements, but we do not want to ensure that, but we do want to ensure that consumers are fully aware of how their information is being gathered and used. As a forward-thinking city, we are generally eager to embrace new technological developments. However, given the current lack of regulation and oversight of biometric identifiers, it is reasonable to take this moment to examine the issues more deeply. We look forward to hearing a wide range of views today on these and other bills. I now hand it over to Chair Person. Nope. I now hand it over to Chairperson Holden, who would like to make a, who would like to proceed with uh, the. I'd meeting. like Sorry. to introduce. Uh, Councilman Richards, who's going to speak on intro 1672, his bill. Thank you, Chair Holden, Cornegie, and Espinal for in hearing intro 1672 today and beginning the conversation around facial recognition technology and biometric data collection. My office worked on drafting this legislation out of caution for the increasing concerns around eroding privacy and the sharing of data without permission. Intro 1672 would require property owners to submit registration statements regarding the, regarding the use of biometric recognition technology. The bill would also require DOIT to establish a public database and provide an annual report to the mayor and the city council. As technology rapidly advances, we must put safeguards in place that ensures transparency for tenants and workers who live or work in an environment where their information is being tracked and stored. I am not sold on the idea that this technology should become an everyday reality for all New Yorkers, but I think the first step is to gain a better understanding of how widespread the use of fa facial recognition technology is so we are better prepared if and when stronger protections need to be put in place. I look forward to hearing feedback from the administration as well as the public so we can make the best decision possible in regards to how this legislation should move forward. I'd like to thank my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, and legislative counsel, Irene Bayofsky, for their work on drafting this bill, and thank you to the chairs. Thank you, council member. I want to uh, recognize council member Lander to speak on his legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to have this hearing today. I appreciate everyone who's here. No one should be required to have their movements tracked just to enter their own home. Uh, but that is the reality that we are starting to face. Landlords' increasing use of facial recognition, biometric tracking, smart key technology, and other technology that tracks your movements just to come into and out of your own home is growing. Uh, and it poses a serious threat to the rights and privacy of tenants. This burden falls especially on rent-stabilized tenants who face surveillance and intimidation from their landlords, and it falls disproportionately on low-income communities and communities of color who are already subject disproportionately to greater surveillance in their daily lives. Uh, increasingly, tenants, including some who are here, are pushing back against the use of surveillance technology in their housing. 
Uh, we're joined today by some tenants from Atlantic Plaza Towers in Brownsville, uh, who together with Brooklyn Legal Services have filed a formal legal complaint with New York State Homes and Community Renewal, seeking to block the use of facial recognition technology in their apartment building, clearly designed for purposes of surveillance, of tracking, of intimidation, of denying people their rights in a building that is overwhelmingly, if not entirely, tenants of color. Um, we've also heard some really um, horrible stories about what the impacts can be on individuals as well. Um, one elderly tenant in Hell's Kitchen, a 93-year-old, was locked out of his apartment because he was unable to use a smartphone to unlock his door using the latch lock, an app that had been installed by his landlord. He literally could not get into his home. Uh, this tenant, along with his neighbors, actually won a court settlement in which the judge required that landlord to give keys to all the tenants in the building. And in many ways, it's the advocacy both of the Atlantic Plaza tenants and that courageous tenant uh, that is behind the bill we are calling the Keys Act, Keep Entry to Your Home Surveillance Free. Um, while I support uh, legislation that would even go further and ban the use of intrusive facial recognition and other surveillance technologies, um, the Keys Act is in part an elegant solution for making sure that everyone has a way of getting into their home that does not require them to subject themselves to surveillance. So the bill would require that landlords give their tenants um, a physical key, a traditional key, uh, to the entry door to the apartment building and also to your apartment itself and would prohibit landlords and building owners from requiring that tenants subject themselves to facial recognition, biometric tracking, or other keyless technologies that have the potential for tracking. Uh, we think this act would go a long way to putting New York at the forefront of protecting tenants, protecting people of color, protecting all of us from the harms that intrusive surveillance pose to our rights and our privacy. I look forward to uh, hearing the testimony from the administration, from tenants, from advocates today. Uh, we've got a lot to learn about this issue as well. Um, I want to thank Anand Zilka for her help in drafting the bill, and Steph Sokowski and Naomi Dan from my office. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Lander, and uh, the Council will read the affirmation to the administration's first panel. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. I just want to remind that uh, Councilman Cornegie will be here in a few minutes, and he will actually uh, also read a statement. Okay, we can start. Good morning, Chairs Holden, Espinal, and members of the Joint Committee. My name is Stephen Atanani, and I am the Executive Director for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, recently renamed the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I would like to thank the Joint Committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Laurel A. Salas regarding Intro 1170 related to requiring commercial establishments to notify customers of their use of biometric identifier technology. DCWP appreciates and shares the Council's concern regarding the collection of biometric information and consumer privacy. DCWP protects and enhances the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. DCWP licenses more than 75,000 businesses in more than 50 industries and enforces key consumer protection, licensing, and workplace laws that apply to countless more. By supporting businesses through equitable enforcement and access to resources, and by helping resolve complaints, DCWP protects the marketplace from predatory practices and strives to create a culture of compliance. Through our community outreach and work of our offices of financial empowerment and labor policy and standards, DCWP empowers consumers and working families by providing tools and resources they need to be educated consumers and to achieve financial health and work-life balance. In today's marketplace, the use of technology to connect to the services and products we utilize is ubiquitous. Advances in technology now make it possible for consumers to use their biometric information for purposes of identification or authentication on networking platforms, devices, and more. Increasingly, biometric information is replacing traditional forms of access control, such as passwords and PINs. At the same time, we are becoming aware of the unique challenges presented 
by the embedding of this technology into our everyday devices and how it facilitates the collection of biometric information by businesses and third parties. For example, multinational companies have long applied their access to consumer photos and videos to develop facial recognition technology. What once seemed innocuous and convenient has now raised legitimate questions of the need of consumer consent and control over the collection, use, and sharing of biometric information. This is even more salient with the potential for large-scale breaches of databases containing consumer biometric information. Due to these concerns, we have seen states across the country, such as Montana, Florida, and even New York State, develop legislation to prohibit the collection of biometric data without consumer consent. Consumer protection is at the heart of DCWP's mission, and a myriad of laws guide our work toward the fundamental principle that an educated consumer is best positioned to make informed decisions in the marketplace. Naturally, a part of consumer education includes requiring businesses to post conspicuous notices and disclosures. DCWP requires signage related to price posting, refund policies, and consumer rights pursuant to various city and state laws depending on the business. To promote compliance, DCWP regularly educates individual businesses and trade associations about their legal obligations. Intro 1170 requires commercial establishments defined as, quote, any premises exercising trade, business, profession, vocation, commercial, or charitable activity, unquote, across the city to conspicuously post signage alerting consumers that the establishment is collecting their biometric information. This information could include a retina or iris scan, fingerprints, voice prints, hand scan, or face geometry. Additionally, these establishments would have to make available online a description of the type of information they are collecting, how long it's been collected for, who they share the information with, and the establishment's overall privacy policy governing the collection of this information. DCWP supports the intent of this legislation, but has concerns with enforcement of its provisions as currently drafted. First, the scope of biometric identifier information is unclear. For example, does a security camera capture an individual's face geometry? If so, does it matter whether the footage was, quote, collected to identify an individual? Absent guidance, the scope of conduct covered by this bill is ambiguous. Second, DCWP's typical enforcement practice with respect to signage requirements is for inspectors to conduct on-site inspections to verify that the signage has been posted. But before issuing a violation, DCWP would need reason to believe that an establishment is collecting, retaining, converting, sorting, or sharing this information. Inspectors in the field will be unable, in most circumstances, to determine whether a business is capturing biometric information, especially if the business is doing so surreptitiously. And DCWP does not have the investigative expertise to assess whether a business is, for example, collecting retina or iris scans. Third, Intro 1170's definition of commercial establishment appears to implicate nearly every brick and mortar business or premise conducting charitable activity in New York City. Determining how those establishments are collecting biometric information and then conducting an on-site inspection and online audit for each establishment poses extraordinary operational challenges. For the above reasons I've outlined, DCWP supports the intent of this legislation, but would like to work with the council and hear from today's panelists about how best to address these enforcement concerns. As I said earlier, DCWP believes that businesses and consumers alike reap the benefits of a fair and transparent marketplace. The agency welcomes a frank and thorough discussion about the scope of biometric information collection, its prevalence citywide, and how we can empower consumers through disclosures to make informed decisions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am now happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Good morning, Chairs Espinel and Holden, and members of the New York City Council Committees on Housing and Buildings, Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and Technology. My name is Robin Levine, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs and Communications for the Department of Information, Technology, and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. I'm here today to discuss Intro 1672 by Councilmember Richards, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring real property owners to submit registration statements regarding biometric recognition technology utilized on the premises. As many of you are aware, DOIT delivers a wide range of technology services to over 100 city agencies and governmental entities. Much of our public facing work that you are most familiar with is our franchise portfolio, wherein we execute franchise agreements with telecommunications companies for use of public rights of way. While that is important work, our core mission as an agency is to help our sister agencies fulfill their duties to serve New York City's 8.5 million residents through technology. Among our functions for other agencies are hosting email, managing the citywide service desk, negotiating master services agreements, hosting nyc.gov, and maintaining data centers. To best serve city agencies with the resources they need, we regularly touch base with each agency's chief information officer. An agency's CIO will make policy decisions on the kind of technology support an agency needs and confers with do it accordingly. We do not and should not unilaterally make decisions about what technology solutions agencies need to fulfill their policy goals, but we do work closely with each agency to figure out how to best support them. Thus, do it service model is designed to serve other government agencies as opposed to real property owners. Intro 1672 would task do it with collecting registration statements from real property owners about the biometric technology they employ, enforce penalties against real property owners for failing to register, and maintain a publicly searchable database of registered properties. While we appreciate the confidence that the council has in do it to fulfill the proposed requirements in this legislation, we are not the appropriate entity to do so. As written, intro 1672 is not about the deployment of technology. It creates a new reporting requirement for real property owners. As such, we do not have existing tracking and enforcement processes that would make this a good fit for do it. Nonetheless, we look forward to working with our sister agencies and the council on an approach that would make best use of our areas of expertise. For example, the section of legislation relating to a public facing database is something we could assist the enforcing agency with building and deploying according to their specifications based on current data collecting and storing practices. We applaud the city council's foresight in tackling this emerging area of policy. Do it has been examining the broader issue of privacy as it relates to our franchisees and today's discussion is a welcome compliment to this work. I'm happy to answer council member questions. Good morning to the chairs and members of the committees that are here today. My name is Sarah Mallory and I am the executive director of government affairs with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Keys Act, sponsored by Councilmember Lander. This bill proposes a modification in the Housing Maintenance and Buildings Codes to clarify that building owners must provide mechanical keys to residents and cannot require the use of only electronic keyless entry methods. The de Blasio administration has made protecting tenants a core part of its strategy to confront the affordable housing crisis. The administration has worked in partnership with the city council and various branches of government to tackle the issue with a comprehensive, multi-pronged approach. As a city, we are focused on keeping people in their homes and neighborhoods by successfully advocating with many members of the council to close loopholes in rent regulation laws at the state level, creating and preserving historic numbers of affordable homes, empowering tenants with more resources, aggressively enforcing city codes, and utilizing all of our partnerships to create data-driven innovative tools targeted at stopping harassment before it starts. Physical security is an important part of ensuring that residents feel safe in their homes. 
Currently, HPD can and does issue violations for building entrance doors and individual unit doors without lock sets in rental buildings or those with only electronic entry mechanisms. Electronic keyless entry methods without the option for mechanical keys are concerning for two reasons. One, dangers posed by being locked out or locked in or not being able to lock a door at all if the energy source for the building becomes unavailable. And two, the potential for electronically tracking the movement of residents. We support maintaining the requirements for manual lock and key sets until electronic methods of entry can be proven to not pose safety or privacy concerns and thank Council Member Lander for his leadership on this issue. Thank you again for the invitation to testify and for this hearing on this bill today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you all for your testimony. We've been joined by Council uh, Member Rivera, Kozlowitz, and Perkins. Um, okay, uh, we're still waiting for Robert Kornicke. He'll be here. He'll be here in a few minutes, okay. Um, let, let's uh, talk, uh, I'd like to ask a question, some questions to the Department of Buildings. Um, how many buildings have keyless entry technologies? Do you know, are you keeping track of that in the city? Uh, sure, so I'm with HPD, the Department of Buildings isn't here today, um, but on my behalf, you know, we don't currently track this. Uh, all are required to have a key lock set, so we make sure that we give violations in any instance where we see that somebody does not have a mechanical key in place. Okay, well, you know what it costs to install uh, the keyless uh, entry technology? Uh, so we don't actually track the private market kind of rates on this, but anecdotally we have heard that they can be expensive to replace. And it, what about in the power outage? Does the keyless entry work? So that's a great question and one of the concerns that we have. Um, one of the things that we talked about in testimony is the concern if during a power outage somebody could be locked in their apartment or out of their apartment or that it could not be locked at all. So we have strong security concerns with that in mind. Should the, um, sh I guess, it, should the city embrace keyless uh, entry technology? I mean, I guess uh, by your testimony. Um, I mean, should it? Uh, great question, and I think it's something that uh, everybody is looking into for security and privacy reasons, and that's one of the reasons why we make sure and support this bill today that uh, having a mechanical key option is necessary until any bugs or details can be worked out of those keyless entry systems. All right, H has the city received any complaints for illegal lockouts due to errors with keyless entry technologies? Um, again, so the code does require that key options in a lock exist, um, but I don't have that granular level of detail with me today. All right. Um, now let's, uh, let me turn to do, to do it. Uh, do you envision, well, how do you envision the enforcement of intro 1672? That's a good question. As I said in my testimony, do it's primary function is to serve other agencies and to administer our franchise agreements. I think that there's a number of existing agencies that handle enforcement, and one of those agencies would be better served by handling the enforcement in that legislation. Right. All right, with regard to the database that do it shall maintain, as outlined in this bill, do you anticipate that the, such a database can be created and maintained with existing departmental resources? That's a very good question. Um, as far as existing resources. Uh, so do it supports other agencies, so we certainly can work with existing agencies to support, uh, to support the development of databases. That is something that we currently do, yes. What steps should be taken to protect privacy? I mean, do you, do you have any ideas on that? I think that's a really great question, and I know protecting the privacy of New Yorkers is something both the council and the administration care a lot about. There's a, there's a bunch of people at City Hall who have been thinking about this. This is an emerging area of technology. We, ha uh, we have a chief privacy officer, which I'm sure you know came out of council legislation. We have a chief technology officer. Uh, so there's a lot of people who are thinking a lot about this. Specifically at Do It, um, we've thought more broadly about, about privacy and again, just how to safeguard the privacy of New Yorkers. Uh, when we developed, uh, when, we, um, when we worked to bring the Link NYC franchise to New York City, we made sure to 
uh, we made sure to ensure that the privacy policy was written as such to make sure that it didn't collect or store any personal identifying information about New Yorkers. Um, do you know um, what city agencies use facial technology today? You know, I can only really speak uh, for do it, so no, I, I do not. So we don't, we don't know how many agencies are using it and what type and so forth. I don't shouldn't, have that, shouldn't that be in your area, I mean, to find that out? As I said, do it primarily works with other city agencies. We don't, we don't set that kind of policy for the whole city, oh. uh, but I'm happy to look into that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we should look into that, definitely. Um, does the NYPD use facial uh, recognition technology? Yeah, so thank you for the question, Council Member. So uh, right now, obviously, we're here to speak to these three specific bills that either name our agencies explicitly or we're the enforcement agencies for it. So we can only speak to our specific agencies about what our uses are of that technology. Actually, Council Member, just to uh, respond to a, a question that you had addressed to my colleague uh, Robin earlier in terms of what agencies may be collecting biometric information. For example, I can speak for DCWP in that we collect um, fingerprinting as well as photographs for a handful of our license categories um, that's pursuant to city and state law. Of course, those individuals that are subject to that consent to it, um, but I did want to just jump in and also answer your question just on behalf of, of my yeah, agency. I, I just think that, you know, certainly do it should have an idea of what city agencies are using facial recognition technology. Uh, we have to get, we have to get a database and just um, to, to really oversee this, we have to get a handle on it and know who's doing what. I mean, that's, that's basic. So I, I think we need to do that and quickly. Um, I just want to, I have, a, I have a few more questions, but I want to turn it over to Councilman Powers for a few questions. Thank you. Thanks for this testimony. I just want to go back to the um, Councilman Lander's bill related to physical key. This has been an issue that has come up uh, probably for about 15 years in Stuyvesant in Town after they installed um, the key card entry and a lot of concerns around tracking tenant movement. And in the uh, previous owner, uh, they had used that um, to look at things like primary residence issues, to track movement, and you know, essentially to use it as a way to deregulate and to evict tenants. Um, so I just want to go back to the, uh, uh, the requirement. So there's a, it, it, am I correct saying there is, I think it's noted in your testimony, a requirement that every building has to have a manual lock, in it, even if they have an electronic system to allow entrance? That uh, yes, that's correct. And I just want to take a step back and say thank you for your support in advocating for those residents. We obviously, as you know, um, care a lot about securing uh, folks so that they're safe in their homes, and we agree on that. But yes, uh, in those instances, we believe the building code uh, says that a mechanical key is required. Okay. And well, what's the purpose of requiring, uh, continuing to require they have a manual lock? Uh, I believe the intent is so that it is so there's not only a um, kind of fob system on its own. So, and then, it, so if, if the owner is not required, I think in where I live, for instance, we have a key card, the owner is not required to give you a key. So in that case, like what, what, what's the purpose of having a requirement to have a lock if you're not receiving a key? Um, so great question, and I would like to look into the details of that further so that we can look at it, because I want to make sure that we're enforcing when necessary and ensuring that you have the right access in those buildings. Okay. Because um, I, th I think probably one of the reasons I suspect is that in case there is an emergency with a uh, power outage or something like that, that you have a manual lock to be able to get into a manual lock. Unfortunately, what happened, what's required then is that if there's another Hurricane Sandy or something like that, the owner then either has to already have the key on hand to distribute or has to rapidly be able to go and make a bunch of keys to let people in. I think where, when Hurricane Sandy hit my neighborhood, I think they just literally just opened the front doors and had security posted at the doors. But it, if, if it is for emergency access, there's also a, 
an obstacle there, which is then you have to have a number of keys available suddenly to let people into the building anyway. Um, I, I'll just note, I think that this issue is a good one because it does talk, it's, it's, it's about safety and security, but also about protecting tenants against eviction and deregulation, although the new rent regulation laws, I think, cover some of that territory. Um, but on the other hand, I also see the ease of access with a, I've lived, I live in a building where you just swipe in and swipe out, and I understand the ease of it, and also my, my building was, this, a tenant in my building was recently attacked. It was an, a really awful incident, and I think having some ability to, to know who was coming in and out of the building helps with safety and security. So um, I, I see both, I certainly see both sides to it, but I think, do, you know, I think if it is for emergencies, if that's the purpose and the intent, then we have another obstacle in, in related to that, and I certainly sympathize with the tenants who are going through, who I think are here, who are going through what many of my neighbors went through, which is a fear of, um, of, of their status, safety, and, you know, uh, uh, security as a tenant, in addition to um, just sort of some, some of those who, who don't have access to that technology. Um, uh, just, just changing subjects for a second. Um, sorry, that's my last question. Um, uh, on the retail component of this, which is about um, uh, uh, biometrics used in the retail industry, there's a, a similarly a conundrum here, which is around um, you know mal potentially malicious use or, uh, but also benefit to potentially benefit to the consumer for marketing of things that they care about. Um, would, in addition to these ones, would there be support from the administration on? Uh, I'm not proposing this, but I'm, I'm asking the question of, or maybe separate of this, of creating, I think if it's, because there are concerns about your privacy and your, how long your information is stored, are there current restrictions or would the administration support restrictions on how long information is kept? Because I think that one of the fears is your private information goes into some database and years later somebody hacks into it and all your personal information is available. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, um, I, can, I can tell you right now, you know, we obviously, as I mentioned in my testimony, our agency is not uh, blind to the concerns around around uh, the collection of, of this type of data. Um, that's why we support the idea of a consumer um, knowing whether it's being collected um, first and foremost. Um, in terms of the duration of collection and uh, the, administra the administration support of that, that's something that we would, you know, I'm happy to take back, obviously, and it's something that really would involve multiple different um, components of the administration um, beyond DCWP. But specifically to 1170, we do believe that consumers are best informed in the marketplace when they know everything that's happening there. And that includes whether or not their information is being collected. I, I just want to add though, I think that in some of these retail settings and um, where I think there is benefit too, of putting another sign up in a store that's a large retail environment probably does little to actually inform the consumer. They're probably walking in to go, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I know tar I'm not picking on a target, but there's a target right across the street from my house. It's widely very popular. People walk in, I think they could post that signage wherever they want in the store. It wouldn't do much to help the uh, consumer know that they're uh, getting access to information. So only if it was posted in a, you know, in a certain set, in a certain place, and in a certain font, perhaps it might be relevant. But I, I think that that's. I know people are. You know, I, I'm skeptical that it's going to go that long to really help inform the consumer. Right, and I think um, to that point, just operationally for us. We also don't want to create a panic or a stir if a, someone walks into their local bodega, for example, and they see a security camera that they think that their biometric data is being collected. So there's certainly conversations that I think we need to have su subsequent to this hearing to really like tailor this and make sure it's operational for us so that we can enforce the intent of the law. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the chair. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Councilmember Powers. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Brannon, and uh, I'd like to recognize. Council Member Rivera, questions. Good morning, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your brief, uh, the, the brevity in your testimony. I just, I, I wanna get a couple of things straight and forgive me if I wasn't paying close enough attention. Does DOIT have any existing database of government properties that utilizes biometric recognition technology? Thank you for that question. Uh, as far as I know, no, we do not. 
Can you give a general overview of the current use of the, the kind of info that you do collect? So it's not biometric recognition technology, but can you give it a general overview of how you currently use the information that you, you do gather? So I know that uh, the, the chair asked, should the city embrace facial technology? And you said that's not your role, right, to decide. Right. But I also feel like, you know, there, there are some metrics, there are some laws put in place at the state level where any modifications and services specifically to residential properties has to go through some sort of approval process. So I imagine you all are working with, a, with the state agency to make sure that everything is done in the right way. And I'm sure this was mentioned earlier, the first application that came in for this kind of technology was at a 700 unit rent regulated building in Brooklyn. However, this kind of technology has been in use for over six years at Knickerbocker Village in Councilmember Chin's district. So considering that the people of Knickerbocker Village feel like guinea pigs and they have already been going through this, and that this kind of technology is becoming more and more frequent and popular, what kind of technology is the city using? What, are, what kind of information are you gathering? I certainly can appreciate that question and certainly your concerns about your constituents. Um, I do want to take a step back and just reiterate that do it do its primary role is to serve other agencies and as I mentioned also administer those franchise agreements so a lot of what we do is support individual agency CIOs and work with them on anything that they want to implement for their particular agency I can't really I, um, I can't really speak to um, to the broader issue of what kind of information is do it currently collecting because from my vantage point uh, we that's not the kind of information we collect that's okay HPD is here <laughs> and HPD could I also I guess answer the question do you think facial recognition should be used at affordable housing developments like Knickerbocker Village uh, it's a great question and I appreciate it a lot I think that there is a lot happening on this kind of as my colleagues testified it is an emerging technology and as you give an example it is being used more widely in buildings. So I think that there are a lot of conversations that we're currently having with our partners, for example, at the Department of Homes and Community Renewal at the state level, um, experts in privacy and technology in the city in order to look at this issue a lot further. We're happy to continue conversations about this to ensure that we are making the right policies to protect folks whenever possible. I appreciate you having the conversation. That's great. Um, I just want to add, you know, this kind of information that we are, I guess, by law as a state giving property owners the right to, you know, if that's their data, I understand there, there are property laws around that. But um, I just want to make sure that, that we are, if we are going to have the conversation, if we are going to have the discussion, that we're doing this fairly and that we're not targeting what seems uh, like people who are less likely maybe to organize or speak up or historically just are marginalized and disenfranchised. So I just wanted to put that on the record and I just want to thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, I want to recognize Council Member Richards with some questions. Thank you. Uh, so let me start off by just asking this uh, straight up. Does the administration support intro 1672? Um, uh, <clears throat> thank, you, thank you for that question. As, uh, as I stated in my testimony, uh, we are not an enforcement agency, so we do think that this, that this legislation would be better served if it was another, admit, if it was another agency administering that enforcement. And do you have recommendations on which agency should oversee that, being that HPD is sitting next to you, or <laughs> the Department of Buildings here today? DOB isn't here today. Oh, uh, <laughs> they're missing an action today. <laughs> We missed them. Let them know we missed them today. <laughs> we can certainly pass along that message. 
Um, because this is because this is a new new bill, I wouldn't want to speak out of turn. We'd have to talk with our colleagues here at City Hall about which enforcement agency might be best. But as I said, there are a lot a lot of agencies that do have the capacity to do enforcement, and enforcement is not something that do it really does. Right. But you would you suggest or would you have confidence? I love that word in your testimony uh, in the Department of Buildings or uh, HPD and facilitating a database such as this? Uh, as, I, as I said, I think any one of those enforcement entities would be better served by the legislation. All right, we're getting somewhere. All righty. Um, does the city currently have data on how many residential buildings use biometric recognition technology or commercial buildings? So on the, on the commercial front, I can speak to that piece. Um, so DCWP does not require our licensees to disclose that. The requirements of what we can or cannot ask for are stipulated by particular license laws that are governed by city and state law. Um, so that's on the commercial side. But you like currently, that. so you're saying currently you have no idea of? Right, we would, we're not asking for it. Um, okay. And we, w we would, you know, as I said, the, the requirements of our categories over 75,000 businesses that we license are, are, are stipulated by current city and state law. Okay, and, and does the city have any measures in place to protect New Yorkers data that could be stored and shared through this technology? So uh, thank you for that question. Um, I certainly <laughs> appreciate your concerns around protecting the privacy of New Yorkers. It's something the administration also cares deeply about. I do want to take a step back um, and speak just more broadly about privacy as a whole and not specifically facial recognition and biometric technology because, as I said, protecting the, protecting the privacy of New Yorkers is something we have, we have thought a lot about. It is an emerging technology and, you know, even though I can't speak on behalf of, you know, my colleagues at the other city agencies, um, on the do it end, we have thought about how to protect New Yorkers' privacies. I mentioned earlier that when we brought the Link NYC franchise to New York, we, uh, we specifically prohibited the use of facial recognition and also put in place some of the strongest uh, safeguards uh, probably in the country. I think even, even Night Clue came out in support of it to make sure that we weren't collecting, to make sure rather that the franchisee was not collecting or storing any of this personal information. And we actually, um, as Chair Holden is aware, we actually do have a couple of bills that are sitting in the, in the technology committee that have to do uh, with restoring uh, internet privacy protections that had been stripped away by Congress through uh, intro 1101. And let me ask you this question. Have, are you aware of any of this information? I, I guess, have you heard from any individuals in residential or commercial buildings um, being concerned about this information being shared with ICE or, or the NYPD? Or have there been any conversations around that? And especially in light of us being a sanctuary city, obviously, this data not having any transparency or accountability leaves us open to, to NYPD and I certainly um, uh, getting some of this, this data. So can you just speak to what, what your agency is doing on that or have you heard of any concerns around that? Again, uh, we of course value the privacy and livelihood of all New Yorkers and we very much share the council's concerns around ensuring that all New Yorkers are, are treated with respect and that we're doing everything we can to maintain you know, um, our standing as a sanctuary city. That said, I can't really, um, I can't really speak uh, from a citywide perspective about about these things, and do it does not do it does not specifically, as far as I know, collect information or really we don't uh, we don't really deal with real property owners or the public. We primarily do serve other agencies, so we're not that external facing. So we don't really deal with the public that much. Okay, well, this is why it's so important we pass these pieces of legislation, evidently. Um, if there is a resident or employee who is concerned about being forced to use this technology in their workplace or home, who should they contact for more information on the protections available to them? So, you know, I think 
it really would depend on a circum on each individual circumstance. But the city, um, you know, just speaking broadly for this for the city, the, you know, the city has a very extensive privacy, uh, personal identifying information policy. And I think if folks, um, I could speak for DCWP in saying that we do, we have not received any complaints, for example, of consumers walking into businesses and feeling as if um, there's any kind of data being collected without their consent. Um, so you haven't received one complaint we have out not. of 8 million New Yorkers? We have not. So you haven't got any emails like I get emails? I have not. Okay. Okay. Maybe they just don't know they, who to complain to. Um, so that means we need to do, obviously, a better job at making sure that information is out there. And then I'll just end on this. Um, what are DOIT's main concerns around the potential widespread use of this type of technology? And what kind of information can be gathered through biometric recognition technology? As I said earlier, um, I can't really speak, you know, if, if we can take a step back, I can talk more about privacy and, and the things that we've looked at and the things that we've done, but I can't really speak specifically to uh, concerns around, uh, around biometric technology in that way. All righty. Well, you're going to become so well versed on this issue over the course of the next few years that next time we come, we're going to be able to speak about the concerns about this. But uh, I want to thank the chairs for holding this hearing, and, and obviously this legislation is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Yeager, and I want to recognize Councilmember Brad Lander for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Holden. And Chair Espinal. Um, uh, Ms. Mallory, thanks very much for your testimony and for HPD's support of the bill. This, this may be the most unqualified support for a piece of legislation that I've uh, ever sponsored before, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have that. And I appreciate it in a, in a way that it reflects a, a, the goal of making sure tenants' rights are protected. Uh, I want to ask some questions that build on uh, Councilmember Powers and Councilmember Rivera's questions. And, um, do go beyond the bill to some extent. I mean, this is also an oversight hearing on biometric scanning and facial recognition and surveillance tracking technologies in residents and, and uh, businesses as well. So beyond the sort of four corners of the, of the bills, this is useful for us to start thinking forward uh, in those ways. Um, first, though, I guess I do just want to clarify, just so everyone has, I said some of this in my opening statement, but I realized after um, Councilmember Power's statement, um, just so everyone's clear, what, what the bill would do, the Keys Act would do, is in addition to the building code already requiring that there be a lock, uh, this would require that landlords give every tenant at least one key to those locks so that they would always have it. Um, you wouldn't have to wait for a power outage, you would have it all the time. And it would prohibit landlords from requiring that tenants use other kinds of keyless technologies. Um, it would not prohibit them from existing, and that's where I want to come back in a minute. It would say you have to be able to get in your door with a mechanical key, and, and it may be, I have to say, I'm going to read this sentence because I really like this. Um, the term key shall mean a piece of shaped metal with incisions cut to fit the wards of a particular lock. Uh, so it's a good old-fashioned mechanical key that you get to open your door with. Um, there might still be uh, keyless uh, fob technology, and there might still be a fac facial recognition technology. You could not be required to use it, which has real benefits. Um, but of course, escaping it might still be hard. You know, there are uh, facial recognition blocking sunglasses and other ways that you could disguise yourself, but still going into and out of your door every time uh, has those challenges. So. The bill gives you a right to escape that technology, but it doesn't really start to take the next steps in figuring out how to restrict its use in our lives. And, uh, and that's where I just, I just want to ask a few more questions about how we're thinking about that. So we use this hearing to push our thinking forward. It sounds like the agencies have started to do that. And I, I wonder if you could just give me a little more sense, what are the principles you're thinking about? You know, um, uh, Councilmember Powers spoke to the benefit of convenience of being able to swipe in easily. So there are some ways about thinking about what the benefits are. I think you spoke to what some of the harms are. There are models people are using in Europe, this sort of right to be forgotten. Um, how are you thinking about it? I like the stopgap or the interim measure of requiring mechanical keys, but as we're thinking about going forward and really protecting New Yorkers from intrusive surveillance, 
Um, you know, are you starting to have some of the principles that will guide that policy? Do you think there is no value in a technology like facial recognition and we might should just prohibit it? Um, how are you um, starting to think about what our longer term policy should look like? A great question and exactly why this conversation is so important because it is so complex and there are so many pieces and partners working on it. So um, all of the things that we've already talked about today are really important to the conversation, including the storage, maintenance, sharing this type of data. So I think that uh, beyond HPD and just the residential piece itself, we look forward and to continuing conversations with tenants and property owners and the many folks involved with expertise in technology and privacy so that we can continue this conversation and see both sides um, making sure always that the tenant's protection and safety is key for us. And do you know whether the uh, HPD or other agencies of the administration has spoken to the Atlantic Plaza tenants or their lawyers or the Hell's Kitchen tenant or the Knickerbocker Village tenants? I don't know specifically, but I'm here today and happy to speak to folks that are here. And <laughs> looking forward to hearing the panel testify as well. And I mean, as we're, so that, I think you're right that it's um, a complex conversation and, and moves in different directions. I wonder internally, you know, is there an administration working group on these issues? Great to have a hearing. We'll hear from the tenants. We can keep the conversations going. We can pass uh, these bills. But, you know, how, how is that? Is there a, you know, wh what's the process for working through, you know, what are challenging issues, but that we really want to um, try to make some, make some clear policy on? Sure. I don't want to speak on behalf of all city agencies, but, you know, each of us do have a chief information officer and technology officers who are working on this in concentration with uh, other folks across each of the agencies and, again, those central folks in the mayor's office as well. So it is, uh, I wouldn't say if I know it's as formal as a working group, it might be that I just don't know of today, but it's definitely ongoing and something that we're talking about every single day, especially when it comes to tenant protection, privacy is really important for us. And I just want to draw a little more out about the details and make sure we're on the same page, which I think we are, uh, you know, but when you say tenant protection, um, you know, the, the risks of tracking, I think, include both the specific risks that Council Member Powers spoke to of landlords seeking to, um, find some way of trying to deny people their rent stabilization rights. Um, so that's one one risk, I assume? Yes, that's definitely something that we're concerned about. Um, the second risk of, of just the more basic, like once your movements are being tracked mm -hmm. and that data exists in a database, that can be shared if there are not rules with anyone, with commercial companies, with you know law enforcement, with private law enforcement. So I assume that's a, a thing we, we want to be very careful about and make sure it does not happen. Yes, absolutely. But we don't yet have any rules, right? So if you do have... I'm really interested in looking at it further, yeah. Right, and I'm just, you know, just trying to flesh this out. So I hear you. If, if a landlord does have today a keyless fob technology, that is, that could be a fob that's specific to the tenant, you know, so the landlord knows who it was and tracks every time you go in and it could be that every one of those things is being recorded in a database that your landlord has. And at least as far as I know today, there's no rules that would restrict your landlord from selling that database to anybody else, to like a commercial company that would want to sell you things, to a private investigator that would want to investigate you. Just like that, that's, am I right that today all the, everything I just said is legal and, and could be happening? Uh, definitely part of the conversation. Happening. But yeah, that's yeah. different. I, uh, do you agree that today that is, that's, a, we, we don't have laws against those things in New York? As far as I know, I don't want to speak, you know, know it perfectly, the federal and state laws here, but definitely think something that we're looking at further. Right. And I'm not, this is not for the purpose of interrogating, of this is for the purpose of just making sure we understand the problems <laughs> we're trying to solve together as we, as we move forward out of this uh, oversight hearing. Um, and then, um, Facial recognition just adds a whole additional dimension to it. Um, it does a lot of the same things, tracks your movements. Um, uh, you know, as has been said a couple of times, facial recognition has been shown to be particularly faulty uh, for people of color, make mismatches. Um, you know, but then everyone who comes and goes, all your friends, all your relatives, anybody that comes to visit, are all being tracked. And again, 
uh, subject to that kind of facial recognition and matching technologies currently with no limitations on how that data could be deployed. And I appreciate um, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Levine that in the case of the links, you guys put some, some restrictions in place on what link can and can't do with that data. But as of today, those restrictions aren't in place for any landlords, whether subsidized or unsubsidized, public or private. We just don't yet have any regulations of that, of that type. All right, so as you, as you mentioned, uh, because Do It uh, directly administers our franchise agreements and Link is under our purview, that is something that we made sure to do. I, I can't speak more broadly about other technology. That's great, I'm just drawing out the point. We yeah. could, I, I, I'll, I'm, th I'm delighted that HPD is supporting today's legislation. I think we should pass it. I agree it's a simpler way of getting at some of these things, but I also don't want us to stop there and for the oversight purposes of this hearing, we can restrict landlords in what they are allowed to do with their tenants' data. And we may decide that certain kinds of technologies are reasonable and appropriate so that Councilmember Powers and his neighbors can continue to swipe into their buildings. Uh, you know, it, uh, that would be a lot easier to feel comfortable. On the one hand, the key will mean when the power goes out, they can still get in and out. It would be a lot easier to feel comfortable if we knew there was a strong law prohibiting landlords from collecting and using the data that might come from those swipes in, in any way that it, you know, if you knew it got forgotten every night or so I, th this is the conversation that I'm eager, whether it's a task force, whether it's future dialogue with the council, whether it's in response to future legislation, that we don't feel satisfied only with what we're doing here today, but that we take good steps forward to really address the, the privacy concerns that are being raised and the safety concerns as well. So, thank you very much uh, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for convening this important. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Uh, I have a question for uh, DCA. Uh, what kinds of disclosures do you think consumers should be provided if they are going to have their face or fingerprint scanned by a biometric technology? So thank you for the, for the question. I would say, as I mentioned in my testimony, we think that consumers should be informed when they walk into a business, whether or not that information is being collected or not. I think one of your colleagues brought up a, a valid point as to what is actually effective notice. And I think that's something that uh, I and my colleagues and uh, I think a conversation with the council um, would benefit from really understanding what exactly would be beneficial. For us as an enforcement agency, the burden is uh, on us in tribunal or in court to prove that this information is being collected. Um, and there's a lot of different pieces to that. And the as we mentioned, the intent of the legislation is is something we support, and it's really about operationalizing it for us. So but by simply putting up a sign, um, you think that's sufficient? Or I mean, I, it might be in a lease, but it, we'd have to know more information about what is being done with this information that's being collected. And that's the important thing. But just simply putting up a sign doesn't tell us what, what the information is being used for. So you're just alerting us that, yes, your, your information is being taken, but Again, we have to know the other step, too. Yeah, yeah. Ac absolutely. I think <clears throat> that those are some of the concerns we have operationally for us is also, you know, how, how do we know when it's being collected? Is it something that a business is engaging in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for example? Is it more tailored? And how is it being collected? Those are all things that really need to be discussed and deliberated over to provide a notice that um, really strikes a balance between not invoking panic upon a customer that walks in, um, but also uh, letting them know that if they're uncomfortable with a particular circumstance that they have the option of, you know, leaving that business, for example. Um, so that's, these are great questions and, and things that I hope to discuss with you so, and your colleagues. So it looks like we have a lot of work to do in this area that we, we, we uh, certainly came to the conclusion today that there's a lot more that can be done by all the agencies, but we really have to get to the bottom of what agencies are actually using it in the city of New York. And again, what are they doing with it? And we don't know that, then we're, we're in 1984. Um, we're, we have a big problem. Um, so we have to get a handle on it quickly but, and that's where I think do it, we, I know you're not oversight, but we, 
you have you have the capability of collecting this information, or at least um, uh, polling the the uh, administration or the, or the agencies. So that I think we could expect from do it. Uh, I'm certainly happy to to take that back to the team and look into this further. Yeah, because this is this is getting into a, such an area that we we should all be concerned as not only consumers, as residents. Um, but this, this is uh, getting into a larger area of the unknown. Um, so um, a lot more has to be done. I just want to recognize Councilman Jonah he just joined us. Um, anybody else with questions? Uh, oh, Councilman Chin, Councilmember Chin. Uh, any other, anybody else? Questions, I can go on. Okay. okay. All right, thank you, panel. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel, uh, Christina Zhang, Josh Steinbauer, Vanessa Brogzali, and Albert Fox Khan. Okay, whoever wants to go, want to start? Uh, okay, on the, uh, yes, on my right, okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Christina Zhang, and I am a co-chair of the Knickerbocker Village Tenant Association, and uh, we represent uh, about 1,600 families in the Two Bridges neighborhood and it's an affordable housing complex. So around 2013-2014, um, the owners uh, installed a facial recognition system in our apartment complex, and we need uh, you know, to use the system to get into our building lobbies. Um, so the complex is comprised of like 12 buildings, and we also need uh, to use that to get into like through the back gates into each of the courtyards. So many tenants have complained at KBTA meetings that the technology frequently does not work. Like you're doing this dance to let, you know, get the camera to recognize you. And um, people, uh, oh, and then like also, you know, people just like follow other people in if, they, if the cameras don't work. And then uh, other tenants have complained that the, um, the cameras at the courtyards are especially problematic because like, you know, the sunlight hitting the lenses doesn't, cause, uh, doesn't make them work properly. And the guards usually end up like buzzing people in. They don't verify like whether they're tenants or not. People just go in and out. Uh, other tenants have mentioned that these cameras don't work late at night, so if, the, if there isn't a security guard in there, uh, then they're just stuck waiting or they have to like, you know, walk around the block to get in through the front gates. And, and then at one point um, when we have meetings with the manager, uh, they've mentioned that you know, they need the, the company to come in uh, like on a weekly basis just to like fix the cameras or to you know, update the system. And it's like, you know, what cause, like what cost? Uh, we're an affordable housing complex, like why do we need this expensive system? And, and then, uh, you know, I've read many news articles about the facial recognition systems and they mention how it's biased against people of color, against women. Uh, Knickerbocker Village is about 70% Asian. Uh, actually, one of my cousins was able to get into my building and she is not a tenant. <laughs> So it matched her with like someone <laughs> who lives there. And I'm also worried that, you know, like how is this data being used? Like, you know, there's been uh, conversations about that. Like, how is it being stored? Like, is management selling the information, like, you know, to private investigators? Are they working with NYPD? Are they working with ICE? Um, 
and management insists that the cameras were installed for safety, but how is it making us safe when people can just follow other people in? Um, and like, you know, we, we just don't understand like what this technology is like really for. So that's my testimony, thank you. Good morning, my name is Albert Kahn. I serve as the Executive Director for the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, or STOP, at the Urban Justice Center. And we have submitted written testimony that explains in detail why we support the Keys Act and Intro 1170 as important first steps to address the threat that biometric surveillance poses to New Yorkers. But I'm going to address the majority of my oral testimony to the claims we heard this morning from the administration officials because, quite frankly, I feel like I have been hearing about a parallel universe, one which has privacy restrictions from the city that bear no resemblance to what we see in reality on the ground in New York City today. I heard the claim that we may become something that resembles 1984. Well, Council member, let me be clear. We are far beyond anything George Orwell would ever have imagined. Today, we know that biometric surveillance is already being used to arrest thousands of New Yorkers. Programs like the NYPD's facial recognition database, which uses untested and scientifically unfound methodologies to try to find so-called matches for existing photos. We heard about a privacy commitment from the city administration uh, that has not manifested on the ground. We were, uh, I believe it was Councilmember Lander who brought up the very important concerns for undocumented New Yorkers that come from this sort of data collection and sharing. Specifically, how it compromises our promise to be a sanctuary city, but we know that this administration has included loopholes in city privacy law, in uh, uh, intros uh, 1557 and 1588 from 2017 to specifically exempt the NYPD from information sharing restrictions, to allow them to share information with the federal government. And with the technology that we're talking about here in the residential setting, with uh, facial recognition in homes, in our very hallways, they kept telling us why we can't do it, why it's too hard, why it's too much of a challenge. Well, I put to you that if other cities around this country can ban facial recognition, if they can take a stance against a biometric dragnet, if they can have bills that go far further than what we are considering here today, then there is absolutely no reason why the city of New York cannot take these first steps and have these modest requirements simply to let New Yorkers know when they're subjected to biometric surveillance. I, I think pro perhaps most telling of all was the administration claim that there hasn't been a single complaint about the use of biometric surveillance in commercial settings. Well, I don't know who they've been talking to, but I get those complaints on a near daily basis, and I'm sure many of you do too. And if they have not been getting many complaints, I can tell you part of the reason why is because we don't have the requirement to post the very sort of notice we are uh, demanding here today. Because many New Yorkers have no idea that simply commuting to the office, their face is constantly being recorded, fed into databases, analyzed, scrutinized, recorded indefinitely, to be used by who knows who for whatever purpose they want, and they have absolutely no right to stop it. We need to enact these reforms, but we also need to go further, and that's why I want to close by once again calling on the City Council to move forward with the only bill that would comprehensively reform our own city's data collection and use of facial recognition and other biometric surveillance, the POST Act. 28 council members have signed on already, and I urge the Public Safety Committee to give us a hearing, and I urge this council to vote and enact the POST Act into law. Thank you. Committee on Housing and Buildings, Committee on Technology, Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and everyone in this room, good morning, thank you. My name is Vanessa Bergenzoli. I am a member of the Tenants Association at 240 Broadway in Brooklyn, New York, the place, the building I call home. I have volunteered to attend this meeting and offer testimony out of great concern for potential violations that the electronic key fob system poses to the right to privacy. 
The building where I have lived for almost a decade was sold earlier this year and a little over a month ago. My neighbors and I received a letter from Livingston Management, the management agent for the new owner and landlord of the building, indicating their plan to switch over from a traditional key to a FOB system. I am providing a copy of their letter as part of my testimony. The owner via management asked for invasive information, including a photograph of myself, as well as the names, permanent addresses, and photographs of people in connection with my unit who would be receiving an additional FOB to enter the building. I do not see why I should have to supply third-party private information to my landlord in order to gain access to the building for those who need to enter my home. That is a violation of their privacy and in forcing me to provide it, I am made complicit in that violation by the owner and management. The letter from management stated that their reasons for the change from key to FOB was an effort to improve, quote, excuse me, an effort to improve security in the building and protect the building and its residents, end quote. Meanwhile, the owner is currently engaged in proceedings to evict many and eventually possibly all of the residents at 240 Broadway, making their claims about the improvements of security simply bogus. It's hard to believe they desire to make the building safe for the very residents they want to evict. A FOB itself may seem harmless, but put the FOB together with the surveillance cameras that have now been installed in the building, photographs of residents and their guests, and with the right technology, software, it can all turn into a facial recognition system used to track the details of tenants' private, private's life, private's life. Why should landlords have access to this level of data on tenants, especially under the guise of collecting such information to improve security? When in reality, the same technology may also be used as a tool to monitor and potentially harass tenants. I was offered no choice. I was offered no information about the FOB, nor about the tech companies that run the system with access to my private information and whether they, in turn, will be providing that information to third, fourth, or fifth parties. In order to have a choice in this matter and not without incurring significant costs, our building's TA sought legal representation to challenge the use of FOB keys. The outcome is still uncertain. And in sharing my experience with you here today, my hope is that it be carefully considered by those who can help protect the right to privacy for all New Yorkers, whether they be renters or landlords. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Josh Steinbauer. I'm a New York City loft tenant. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, the actual experience of using, uh, of coming into a building with the FOB system. Uh, from 2004 to 2014, I lived in a loft building in South Williamsburg. As a community of creative folks in numerous units of uh, live workspaces. In 2014, the building was served a vacate order from the DOB. All of us were locked out of our homes without access to our possessions, uh, despite being protected tenants with provisional loft law coverage. Numerous legal actions were required, and the residents were sunk into over $100,000 in legal costs. When, after four years, we finally won and regained entry, the landlord had uh, broken and propped open our windows, effectively turning our homes into a pigeon coop, which destroyed all of our possessions. We also found that we could not access the building with our old keys. Instead, uh, the doors were changed to a fob system, and there were uh, cameras set up in the hallways and in the common area on the rooftop. Uh, we were given only one fob key. The landlord refused to provide us with any FOB keys for guests, even though that's legally required. There's no backup system, which is also a legal requirement, so if the computer crashes, uh, we're essentially all locked out. At one point when a FOB key was lost, the landlords demanded that we come to their office and pay $35 for a replacement. Uh, what's more dreadful is the incessant tracking and surveillance that these FOB keys offer. Uh, the residents know from previous and ongoing lawsuits that our landlord is hostile and litigious. Personally, I know through the course of the legal battle for our loft law protection that the landlord's lawyer tried to use my out-of-town work as a mean to exclude me uh, from coverage. 
while my out-of-town work uh, turned out to be completely legal, it did force me to dig up a seemingly endless paper trail of receipts and check stubs and bank statements in order to prove it. Uh, unfortunately, the FOB system uh, just becomes simply a means for the landlord to eventually do this again, bring me to court, um, and not because it's uh, any more true, but simply to bury me in legal fees. Uh, to me, it's an ongoing and daily harassment. Uh, there's something fundamentally unethical about residents being subjected to tracking and surveillance uh, simply for winning our, uh, exercising our tenants' rights. Uh, thank you very much for your time. All right, we've been joined by Councilmember Torres, Ulrich, and Kornicki. And um, do, you, do you want to wait and give your, okay. We'll, <laughs> all right, um, uh, Councilman Lander has uh, some questions. Thanks very much to all of you for being here, and especially to the to the tenants for sharing your stories. I think this is, uh, you know, clearly a much wider uh, issue than than you know any individual building knows or sees. It's been sort of fought between individual, you know, buildings, land, some large complexes, but landlords and their tenants. And because we don't have any way of knowing how widespread it is, um, I think it's really valuable to have your testimony, and just makes it even clearer why we've got to move forward. Um, both with the Keys Act, but then also with some broader prohibitions and guidelines on, on tracking technologies. Um, so I guess um, that's the question I, I want to ask. Um, Mr. Khan, you, you, know, you spoke to what other cities are doing, and I know that San Francisco and Oakland have banned facial recognition technology by law enforcement. Do you know, are there municipalities or states or even other countries that are restricting uses of these technologies by landlords and businesses? So it's something that's emerging as a real point of contention around the world. I know off the top of my head that Oakland has a bill that's actively under consideration. Uh, not Oakland, sorry, Portland, uh, that would uh, ban uh, private sector use of facial recognition. And so besides the Portland bill, I'm not immediately aware of other bans that would apply to private sector implications, but we can certainly send follow-up information about the municipalities that have done that. And I would also want to note that recently in uh, London, the senior law enforcement officials have come out against their own use of facial recognition, hi highlighting the discriminatory impact on people of color, as well as the overall privacy uh, cost. But we will certainly follow up with more examples. Um, and then I'd just love to hear, I guess, from, from the panel in general, a little more as we're thinking, you know, downstream. Again, hopefully we'll get the, the Keys Act passed, which will at least mean everybody gets a key and doesn't, isn't required to use any of these other systems. But as we're thinking a little further forward, um, you know, do you have a gut on where we should just prohibit things, like we should not have facial recognition technology, where we should restrict the data and tracking. So, you know, for example, it could be okay to have a, a swipe or a key card so long as that data was not being uh, retained and made available. How, how do you think about what you would want to have as we develop a longer term uh, policy here? And I'll, anyone that's got a point of view on it, I'm interested to hear. Well, it sounded to me like the city didn't want to be particularly responsible for the housing that it uh, that it is responsible for. So to me, it seems like you get rid of all of the uh, uh, facial recognition technology or or a landlord's ability to track uh, and surveil their tenants, like across across the board. Um, so Stop believes that facial recognition is not compatible with a free and democratic society and that we need to ban the uh, technology comprehensively. One of our big concerns with key fobs and other forms of entry passes is currently federal law allows ICE to come in and subpoena that information with, little, with very little protection. And no matter what um, moves the city council makes, federal law will preempt uh, city law so long as that data exists. So the strongest path forward to protect privacy is to simply prevent that data from being collected in the first place through bills like the Keys Act, but also bills that would go further and talk about the use of smart, uh, smart thermostats and other appliance monitoring within apartments. If uh, that data can be used by a landlord to monitor when someone's home or not. Uh, similarly, we have to look at the data that the city is aggregating, which itself 
can be used by ICE, such as plans to expand um, tracking through congestion pricing, as well as um, the city's uh, work with the MTA to promote the Omni Fair payment system, which again collects a lot of individualized data on New Yorkers as they travel around, creating a repository which can potentially be excluded, can potentially be used by ICE. And this is the reason a lot of immigration advocates came out in opposition to the administration's plan to add a payment chip to the IDNYC municipal ID, fearing that just this sort of data aggregation by the city can inadvertently make us ICE's best friend. Just to make sure I understand this, so you know, let's say for example, we wound up saying about a key fob or a cell phone type lock technology, which understandably some people find very convenient. You know, you don't need to find your key, you just walk by the door and it opens for you. But even if we took the step to say, um, to have a subsequent law that says you may not retain or you know, sell or transfer the data that would come. Obviously, there's a digital trace on all those things. And if ICE came and sought to subpoena that information from a landlord, they could be obligated under federal law to provide it, even if we had a local law in place that sought to prevent that. Exactly. So federal laws that would be directly in conflict with the city laws would preempt any city law. So you could potentially say you will not retain this data. And then when ICE comes in and subpoenas it, there will be less of that data available. But if ICE comes in with a warrant requiring real-time transfer, there would be nothing that city law could do to protect them. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, minimizing data collection is one of the most important strategies we've seen, not just here in New York, but in cities all across the country. I just want to mention, like, here in Knickerbocker, like, we don't know exactly what data is being collected. Right. Like, like they've, they haven't told us anything. So it's Wait. worrisome, like, you know, we just have no idea. And being a community of, like, you know, 70% Asians, and most of them are immigrants, like, it's worrisome if they, like, you know, collude with ICE. Like. Yeah. No, I mean, your testimony, and I think we're going to hear the same from the Atlantic Plaza Tower tenants as well, really drives the point home that you're, you're getting all of the risks and harms, none of the information, and none even of the, the reported benefits, right? So it sounds like you, you may actually, just from a narrow, like, might there be an intruder in the building, you might be more likely to have one now than you were when you had a traditional key, given the, this, uh, you know, the mismatches, the, the breakdowns, the, you know, all the things that you mentioned. So you, there's no benefit for the tenants in terms of safety. You're exposed to all of the surveillance and you have no information on, on what uh, is being done with that information. So, um, no, that, I mean, we've got to do more here and, um, and, and I feel like on the one hand, getting you a key that would let you in will help, but we clearly need to go further uh, to make some changes in, in what's allowed in that kind of tracking technology. So thank you again for being here this thank morning. Thank you, Councilman Lander. Um, I want to just mention, uh, just at Knickerbocker, you said that the facial recognition didn't work many times, or it was just once it didn't work, or, or have you also heard complaints from the other tenants about it not working, the facial recognition? Uh, both, like, you know, it hasn't worked for me sometimes. Um, actually, it didn't work for me at, you know, the entrance gate uh, on Saturday, and the security guard just buzzed me in. So, so what happens? What, how long are you delayed? I mean, if it doesn't work, then it just doesn't work. You're just standing there, like, you know, dancing in front of the cameras. <laughs> uh, you see many tenants, like, do the same thing, and, you know, maybe, like, it works for someone, and then everyone goes in. Uh, so, it, it, like, I don't know, like, under what circumstances it works, but, like, you know, sometimes it lets you in like that. Other times, like, you're just stuck. You're locked out. <laughs> Is there a sign in the building that says they're using facial te uh, recognition technology? No. There's no sign? No. And so um, you didn't have to uh, sign any document um, as a waiver? I don't think we did that. We just got a notification that management is installing this facial si uh, recognition system and that we have to go down and get our photos taken. So you had to like it or not, you just, you had to... Uh, exactly, okay. we had no choice. Uh, just a question on the fobs. Um, your your um, building had only, you only get one fob, is that, did I hear that? 
right? So what happens? Uh, I mean, uh, do you have to pay for another one or? Right, exactly. So if I have someone visiting, I have to be there or we have to coordinate handing them a, uh, you know, how, how we're going to navigate somebody getting into my home. But they don't give you an option to purchase additional. No, they they would not. And but you you, you don't have a key. I mean, also. legally they're supposed. So there's no to, there's no key entry at all. There's no backup at uh, all. No. Okay. No, no, yeah, the keys that used to open the door no longer work. Hmm. Okay. Uh, did, did anything with a power failure? Um, did you ever experience a problem yet? I mean, we just got back in, so there you hasn't got, been a power okay. failure yet. But. Okay. Um, Councilmember Chin has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask the panel that, do you consider, I think Nicobac Village is in my district, and I know that one of the reasons that, you know, the landlord was talking about, because a lot of people, they feel that don't live in the building or not on record, but we have such a affordable housing crisis in the city. A lot of families are doubling up, tripling up. Um, do you consider what the landlord's doing, you know, with his facial recognition, the key fob, as a form of tenant harassment? I guess I do. <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Uh, I mean, it just feels like they're like tracking our every movement. Like, you know, like there were things discussed that I hadn't even considered. Like, are they tracking like, you know, oh, Christina goes in and out like five times a day. Like, do, like how necessary is that information? Like, it, it doesn't really provide security or safety. Um, at STOP, we're quite concerned about how uh, biometric surveillance empowers landlords to harass tenants, not merely by tracking every single action they take near the building or in building hallways, but there's emerging forms of artificial intelligence software called gate detection and other uh, products that try to predict what our mood is. What, you know, they try to say, is someone happy? Are they sad? Are they depressed? And that's another level of intrusive surveillance that landlords will be able to deploy unless we stop it here and now. And you can easily imagine the situation in which landlords try to predict who's going to be a, quote, good tenant based off of these sorts of highly invasive forms of AI and trying to micromanage every part of our activity. And we've already heard horror stories of people receiving fines and warnings for their activities in their own buildings because of these systems. As I mentioned in my testimony, my uh, building was sold earlier this year and the new landlord wants to potentially evict and kick everyone out. We are a building of mostly working artists, one of the last surviving ones in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And um, this VOB technology has the potential for um, being used as a method of harassment in, that, in light of the current circumstances of the tenants in the building. Uh, I, I would say absolutely. Uh, w one of the ways that landlords uh, harass uh, tenants in a situation like this is, is to take them to court to challenge whether they have, uh, you know, in our case, it's we have law law coverage. And one of the ways that they harass you is to say, like, well, this might not be your your primary residence because I see that you were, you know, you were not there for two to three months because uh, you were, you know, in cases of work or in, in, in other, a lot of other instances. Uh, and uh, it forces the tenants to just, you know, you, you're sunk in, you're sunk in legal debt. I mean, it, it costs so much, you know, it was $100,000 just to get back in our building and find all of our possessions destroyed. So it's, it's just one of the ways that the um, uh, landlords harass you. I think, you know, that is really happening across the city for many, many years. And I think that um, even in the case of Nicobaco Village, I mean, the landlords is looking for a uh, big rent increase. And I think that, you know, for government subsidized housing and rent regulation, that we have to do more oversight. I mean, the tenant, you know, should organize and complain about it. But at the same time, I think as a city, as a state, we need to really provide more oversight. I mean, now that we have stronger rent laws, we have to make sure that landlords are not using these kind of technology to harass tenants and force them, you know, to leave their home. 
So that's something that we look forward to working with you on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Torres, questions for this panel? Uh, thank you for your testimony. I should confess that, you know, I'm in favor of reforming and regulating the use of uh, facial recognition technology. I'm not quite sold on the need to ban it altogether, but I'm, I'm open to persuasion. Um, it, you were sharing your experience of landlords using facial recognition technology as a means of locking out tenants. In some sense, if, is that, if I understood your, your testimony correctly, or? Uh, uh, locking out tenants? Uh, to, to deny them the, their, the coverage, the loft law protection coverage in okay. our case. Okay, I must, have, I must have misunderstood then. Um, it sounds like you feel like we're heading in the wrong direction because most of our bills are aimed at setting standards of transparency and accountability, but it seems like you're in favor of banning it. I want to just build on some of the questions that Councilmember Lander asked earlier. Are you in favor of a categorical ban on, on facial recognition technology, both public sector and private sector use? Is that your position? Uh, yes. Yes, that is our position. The reason why is, according to MIT and Stanford researchers, uh, when they looked at all the commercially available facial recognition products last year, they found that for someone like me, they're pretty accurate under the right circumstances. But for black women, they were wrong one in three times. One in three times. And when you have that sort of performance gap, you are baking in the sort of bias and discrimination we've seen for so many decades in New York City with human decisions, and you're automating it, and you're making it more obscure and harder for people to challenge. Because we'll see New Yorkers arrested, and it will be on the basis of this facial recognition uh, database. And on, they won't even know that a lot of the times. Thousands of them. and so. Even if you think that facial recognition has a place in our society, I would put to you that it cannot be a part of it yet. Not when it continues to discriminate at this level, not when it continues to get it wrong time and time again for the same communities that have been over-policed for so many decades. And I think when we see it in the housing context, we have those exact same risks and we are already seeing this dystopian nightmare where tenants are being tracked and harassed and potentially even evicted because of these technologies that are fundamentally reshaping the power balance between landlords and tenants. So it sounds like your objection is not so much to the technology per se, it's the underlying algorithm. I would discriminatory say, bias built into the algorithm, is that? I would say if the algorithms worked as advertised, it would still be deeply, deeply problematic because... And why is it problematic at that point? So if I get good news walking down the street and I start doing a silly little dance, I don't want to think that there's some form of AI that's tracking my movement, that's saying, is that movement pattern indicative of someone who poses a threat? Is that threat something that needs to be logged? Does that need to be sent to the NYPD? That's not an exaggeration. That sort of technology already exists. And it undermines our ability to freely move about our society when we second guess how every action will be misunderstood and miscategorized by some form of artificial intelligence. It's deeply so, chilling. So your concern is that the facial recognition technology has a chilling effect on the free movement, free, couldn't the same be set up cameras? Yes, the thing is, the biggest shift we've seen isn't technological so much as economic. Facial recognition makes it incredibly cheap to track moment by moment the movement of millions of New Yorkers. It would have taken tens of thousands of dollars to track a single individual 30 years ago simply using a bunch of officers, using multiple cars in multiple teams. The cheaper it becomes to surveil all of us, the more that technology is used for incredibly small infractions. It currently is used for things like graffiti offenses and used for you know, uh, someone who takes a beer from a CVS. And so the cheaper it is to use these uh, Orwellian technologies, the more often we will. But the thing is that 
I don't think we even have to get to that uh, philosophical question for another few years because the technology is so blatantly biased and broken today. And so even if you don't agree that it is deeply chilling, I, I would hope that you do agree that there's a profound risk that as these tools work now, they are going to perpetuate the same sort of biases we see with human decisions. Yeah, I I feel like in your exchange with Councilmember Lander, you mentioned in passing your concern about, you said indoor appliances or? So we saw. The sensors in apartments, is that what you're? So there are smart meters, yeah. which are devices that will monitor our electricity usage throughout the day. There's a concern that even the data gathered by those could be of use to law enforcement or ICE, for would example. You, would you be in favor of banning those? I would need to look at what the proper regulatory environment would be for those. I, I'm not, that's not something where we can say definitively today they pose such an outsized privacy risk that we would need to ban them. And, and let me be clear, our organization does not go nearly as far as a number of reformers in advocating for comprehensive bans. We only do it with those technologies that pose such a potent privacy risk that we see no possible path for them to be used without an outsized discriminatory impact. You brought up the risk of ICE mm -hmm. obtaining the information, which is not a risk that anyone here takes lightly. Is there any example in the country of ICE obtaining via subpoena information collected by facial recognition technology? Or? of ICE obtaining yeah. by, well, we has, has that transpired before, is that, or is we, that a theoretical fear? Or? Well, let me take a step back and talk about uh, sort of the information sharing environment more globally. So we know, for example, that ICE for years has used automated license plate readers. And then we found out in 2016 that they were using a, a vendor called Vigilant Solutions. It so happens that Vigilant Solutions contracts with police departments all across the country one of which happens to be the NYPD. And then we found out that there were individuals who had been detained by ICE because of uh, license plate data that was uh, given, not in those specific cases by the NYPD, but by other law enforcement departments to Vigilant Solutions, which in turn, it was used by ICE. And with facial recognition in itself, you have to understand this is such a new technology in its mass deployment that we aren't going to yet have the sort of data collection that we have with these other tools. What we do know is that they are trying through vendors like Palantir to aggregate this data at wherever possible, that they're using more data-driven uh, detention practices to have these algorithmic systems direct them to uh, immigrant communities, and we know that there is a huge danger there. And, and really, I, I think with ICE in particular, we can't wait until they've already abused the system to address the obvious threat. But it sounds like the council's being too timid. I would say uh, the council, the, I, I would the, always- that, that these, these bills are scratching the surface. It's not addressing the root causes. I, I would say that these bills are important first steps, yeah. but that more action is necessary. Right. Thank you for your testimony, sir. And thank you, panel, for your excellent testimony. We thank you very much uh, for going through all the questions. And uh, uh, we're going to, before we call on our next panel, I want to um, recognize the uh, chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, my co chair for today, Councilmember Cornicky, for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Chair, for your indulgence. Um, I'm going to read my uh, opening statement for the record, having full knowledge that you've begun and delved deeply into this conversation. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm count, uh, well, actually, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I want to thank Chair Holden of the Committee on Technology, Chair Espinal of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and other members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings for joining the hearing on facial recognition technology. As discussed by Chair Holden, facial recognition has slowly begun to permeate our society, particularly during the last few years. Facial recognition and other smart lock and keyless entry technologies can be found in tens of thousands of homes throughout the city. This technology provides some con conveniences, for example, allowing a property owner to deny access to a former tenant without changing the locks and providing for increased security over building common areas. At the same time, this convenience comes at a price. Facial recognition and other smart lock technology can be used to track tenant movement. 
recording when a tenant accesses his or her home. This data can be used to harass tenants, particularly rent-stabilized tenants, to vacate their homes. In addition, some smart lock technology can have a discriminatory impact. Facial rec recognition technology has a higher error rate when identifying people of color, as was mentioned earlier, particularly black women. As a result, people of color who reside in buildings that use this technology could be locked out of their own homes. Other smart lock technology, for example, technology that uses mobile phone applications can discriminate against those who do not have smartphones, such as the elderly. While some ten tenants embrace the opportunity to use new technology, existing law does not allow tenants to opt out of using this technology and use an old-fashioned mechanical key, key instead. The pre-considered introduction that we've heard today, sponsored by Councilmember Lander, requires landlords to give tenants mechanical me metal keys and forbids landlords from requiring that tenants use facial recognition or other smart locks to access their homes. This legislation will make sure that tenants have a choice and do not feel pressured to use the new technology. Again, thank you, uh, Chair, for allowing me that. I just want to point out that I thought I heard the former panel mention that this was Orwellian technology. Did somebody say that? That is a term that I'm quite familiar with, and I just didn't know that that would be brought up today. Uh, so, so thank you for uh, a throwback to my graduate school days. <laughs> the year you graduated in 84 now. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, my next panel, uh, uh, Tasliam Francis, Fabian Rogers, Isme Gardner, Samar Katarni, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, Anita Booker. And you are all tenants? Yes. Okay. Okay, we can start to my right. Okay. You want to go the other way? Okay, we'll go, then we'll go to the far left here. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Fabian Rogers. Should I start my testimony? Um, so I'm here today and I want to say thank you on behalf of all the committee. What's up? Bring the mic a little closer. Oh, just, yeah. sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so hello city council committees uh, that are here today. Uh, my name is Fabian Rogers. I'm a resident here on behalf of the many tenants like those who speak after me. Um, from of Atlantic Plaza Towers in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, and potential tenants all throughout New York City. I come to this occasion with a critical lens on the issue of the uprise of biometric surveillance and security technology in different facets of our society because of the potential lives that can be heavily affected by these innovations. More specifically, my personal testimony is aimed at the potential legislation on the table today that focuses on this type, of this type of technology's use in the housing sector, both public and private. With regard to the bills that we're engaging in discourse over, I'm here to strongly suggest the idea of a moratorium on these because of the stage at which tech giants, even tech giants such as Microsoft, IBM, and Face++ are at with their facial recognition technology. Although I'm grateful that there are government policies being presented at all, I have to be mindful of the strength of these policies and how much prote protection they would provide for tenants like myself. With dealing with the vast and rapid pace of integration of technology within our society, we have to be mindful of the consequences of dealing with new, untested, and possibly incorrectly regulated biometric technology. We have to constantly ask ourselves, what are we dealing with here? Who, uh, who is affected, how are they affected, and how does that then impact the rest of society? I recommend a, mor a moratorium because although these bills mean well, I still had discomfort with the legalese of the bills proposed. I worry that despite the premise of justice in these bills, the outcome upon these bills being passed might not reach the feats of justice we hope for. Um, that worry stems from the issue that, li that the lives that would be impacted have yet to truly be heard and considered. I worry that these bills would unfortunately and shrewdly fall short of providing full protection to all tenants in the face of unsanctioned innovation with facial recognition technology today. 
Um, interestingly enough, we often talk and focus on the steps of innovation of these emerging technologies around us. We get caught in the glamour of a new gadget that might offer a better sense of convenience in everyday activity. However, we don't think or talk as often about the missteps that come with innovation. Just like other science experiments, the hypotheses that come with these technologies can have room for errors. Typically, that margin of error is fine to tinker with and improve upon. But the major difference here is that the margin of error of facial recognition technology involves everyday people's personal biometric data. That the, the repercussions of this type of error can cost everyday people information that the, that the government couldn't even afford to replace. A person's biometrics is essentially priceless and unique to them, but with this legis legislation, we are still allowing for that private in information to possibly be monetized without allowing control to the people who give up their private information in the first place. This legislation is set in a way as though we assume this facial recognition technology is foolproof when tech giants such as Microsoft, IBM, and Face++ have elusively said otherwise. A study done by Joy Bulamwin, Bulamwini, I apologize, I'm really bad at announcing names. A researcher at MIT and Tim Nick Gib Gibru, a researcher at Microsoft, through using the evaluation systems of about 2,200 to 2,300 facial profiles harvested from the internet, marketed or created, uh, that were marketed and created by Microsoft, IBM, and Face++, have found that there are massive inaccuracies, particularly among the demographic of women of color. Although darker skinned women profiles only accounted for 21% of the entire test pool of faces to be evaluated, their, pro, uh, their profiles accounted for nearly 61% to nearly 73% of error rates within these same facial recognition technologies being marketed by the near forerunners of this type of technology. The folks who are essentially leading the world in technological innovation in this facet still have a large margin of error yet to be addressed. Ironically, the, dem the demographic at peril in this study is more likely the first and main demographic at peril in reality. With gentrification phasing out the diversity in neighborhoods, these technologies will be used as surveillance tactics to essentially speed up that process, allowing landlords another metric to be an intrusion among the privacy of tenants like myself and those you'll hear after me. Because there is no regulation around these technologies, startup companies such as Stonelock, the company in the midst of trying to use the technology on the, build, on the buildings which me and my tenants come from, can use this technology without necessarily having validation studies that, um, to show that they have actual efficacy on the data that they would harvest. Think about for a second if you can. If tech giants don't have a grapple on efficacy with all the demographics and startup companies may not even be required to have validation studies checked and critiqued, where does that leave the margin of error in, in reality? We are no longer talking about practice studies. We are talking about reality, even, have a, even having a worse reflection of what we've seen from information from knowledgeable data scientists that have shown us time and time again that this stuff doesn't work. Potentially black and brown bodies who can't afford to have a voice in this battle because of everyday life challenges can be taken advantage of and tied in to biometric data mismatches that could cost in their lives as law-abiding citizens. This intrusion on personal data starts from a premise of inaccuracy and will inherently have an outcome of heavy, heavy inaccuracy that could potentially lead to eviction, unlawful arrest, and unlawful mismanagement of people's personal data. The potentiality for people's biometric data to be taken advantage of, not just by landlords, but by hackers, exponentially grows with the uprise of startup tech, tech companies that don't match the liking of tech giants such as Microsoft, IBM, and Face++, thus leaving tenants like myself in a place of peril as I'm a test subject along a larger scheme for hasty integration of technology in our society. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. I am Icy Mae Gardner Downs. I'm a representative of Atlantic Plaza Towers Tennis Association, and I have been a tenant there since 1968. Atlantic Plaza Towers is composed of two 24 story buildings with a total of 714 rent stabilized units in Brownsville section of Brooklyn. It is owned by Nelson Management Group. The demographic makeup of the complex is about 80% females and minors of colors. In the fall of 2018, we received a mailing from New York State Housing 
and Community Renewal Office of Rent Administration slash MCI unit, better known as DHCR, stating our owner had filed for a lease modification to install a facial recognition system to replace the current two key fob door entry system. The notice instructed us to check yes box if you agreed or check the no box and explain why you disagree and return by deadline. Attached to the notice was a list of every tenant's name and apartment number in your respective building. Privacy be damned. With no guidelines from DHCR, we decided to do the following. Organize and educate ourselves about facial recognition and biometric data technology. We Googled until our fingers were numb. We seeked out help from elected officials, technological experts in Brooklyn Legal Service of Brownsville and media outreach. Where are we today? On May 1st, 2019, we filed our opposition papers with DHCR at their Jamaica office. Our state senator, Assemblywoman Latrice Walker, has introduced a bill A7790 to prohibit the use of facial recognition system by a landlord on any residential premise. The Senate version is S5687. Questions to the city council members. Did you speak to any experts who know about this technology before you drafted these bills? Did you speak to any tenants currently living in buildings with a facial recognition system to find out about their experience and concerns? Did anybody tell you that HPD did not inform the tenants that they had a right to keys, a physical key, if their landlord put in the key fob system because we just became rent stabilized two years ago and HPD allowed our landlord to put in a key fob system and never told us we were entitled to a key. And we have had incidents where we have been locked out of the building and had to wait for people to exit the building in order to get in. Remember, we have to go through two doors in order to get in our building with a key fob system. Did anybody tell you that landlords will lock you out of your apartment, your, your, or I should say disconnect your key fob, because they notice that you haven't been using it lately, so maybe you don't live there anymore? Yes, this happens, okay? <laughs> Sorry, because council members, if you had spoken to either of these groups, then you would know these bills do not go far enough. We, the tenants of Atlante Plaza Towers, do not believe that intro 1672 and T2019-4579, as proposed, are not strong enough to support our opposition to the use of facial recognition and biometrics data collection in residential buildings. We know that facial recognition slash biometric surveillance systems have already been installed in residential buildings. We ask for a moratorium to stop any current or planned use of these systems until there is a full ban in place. For we are going nowhere fast, but we can go somewhere slow. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Booker. I live in Atlanta Towers for 21 years. It might sound repetitive for what I'm saying because of what Ms. Icy just spoke about. As tenants of ATA, Atlantic Towers, why wasn't we informed about this meeting pertaining to our place of residence in advance? Last year, DHCR sent out an owner's application for modification of services, provided residents with 20 days to respond with a yes or a no, when some residents, I take that back, the majority of the residents either didn't receive it or received it after the deadline because this was the renovation. There was a res renovation going on in the building. This is the packet here that DHCR sent out. I know this because a few of us canvassed the tenants in the lobby after the tenants' monthly meeting. Tenants have so many issues that needs to be addressed. Why is this facial gadget such a, a big deal to install, which is very frightening because it's an invasion of our privacy? People with money is starting to fixing up our neighborhoods to bring the property value up so the poor people like me can't afford to live here anymore. Yeah, gentrification. 
I am, you excuse me, because I am pissed at what's going on. I am part of EBC, East Brooklyn Churches, and we are finding out that there are so many people losing their homes because of the changes taking place. Now we have to fight to protect our privacy where we live. As it's written in the DHCR package, the owner is seeking to install to this increase the safety and security of the building's residents. When you enter the building with your key fob, some can walk in behind, someone can walk in behind you. What difference is it going to make if our face is scanned? Someone can still walk in with you off your facial scan. I'm getting off of what I said, what I was just talking about. When they presented a key fob to us, they told us the key fob couldn't be duplicated. When they sent, DHCR sent this package out, they claim that, oh, it could be duplicated. So it's like they're saying two different things. Now going back to what I have written. I have my proof that ATA security wor um, works. The five of us who was asking other tenants if they received the package from DACR, the human security guard reported us and weeks later, a week later, we received a letter saying that the lobby is not a place to solicit, electioneer, hang out, or loiter. To top it off, we also received a color photo with our apartments. I have the paper right here, see in color. Okay, just a second. In color, sounds like we have perfect security. We are not here to speak only on behalf of the tenants at Atlantic Towers, with so many people needing housing, with how its so-called affordable housing is now being designed with this bio gadget, people are being forced to scan, to be scanned before they sign their lease. Is that the government way of to say, we control you? I ask you, how would you feel as a tenant if your landlord installed this gadget that would invade your privacy and you don't know where it would end up? When tragedy hits, we tend to come together. I'm asking, please consider this a tragedy waiting to happen. Please work with us to come up with a strong bill to prevent this bio gadget out of residential areas. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chair and Council Members. My name is Tasling Francis, and I am currently a working mom who has been raised from a third generation and now raising a fourth, all rented and residing in Atlantic Plaza Towers in Brooklyn, New York. Alongside many of us who have lived here just as long as I have, would like to continue to raise our children in an environment where we already feel safe and secure with the many forms of security provided. This is why I'm proud to be here to represent myself, Atlantic Plaza tenants, Atlantic Plaza Tower tenants and others who are in opposition for this biometric system referred to as facial technology and other forms of technology that uses our biometric identity as a form of entry into a place of residence without an option to consent. We are urging the council to broaden federal privacy legislation against the use of biometric data collection in residential buildings across New York City and not just for Atlantic Plaza Towers. I'm testifying that we push for a, a moratorium and a ban for the, on this matter since the tenants feel that security, which is why Nelson Management wants to input this technology in the first place, is not an issue on where we live, but merely have an issue with discrimination and how minorities, predominantly women, who are raising families are being treated and the, risk, the introduction of risky surveillance systems that would also scan out children, which can also um, cause a huge issue uh, because children's facial features can change over time. And as we all may know, that in history, we, which some systems have appeared beneficial to citizens, especially without proper knowledge or education, we have in fact become so unsafe that the harm to benefit ratio becomes inexcusable and unfair and should be enough to bear in mind complete bans. I may sound cliche, but this is an example of everything that glitters just is not gold. The law already prohibits certain kinds of dangerous digital technologies, such as spyware, and I honestly feel that facial recognition technology can become far more dangerous, especially since hackers are still at bay and is in dire need for pro prohibition in the residential building. When entering our building, we come through a door without a key, but then the next two are required the use of electric key fobs upon entry for a total of three doors. We have gates that are all around the premises that we must use for key fobs. There's an intercom system, another form of electric use, electronic use, to which a visitor enters a numerical passcode for the apartment they want to visit, and the tenant can speak back and then press a button to unlock the door. 
Alongside the intercom system, our cell phones can be attached to this device in the cases to which you can, do not use your key fob. We can use our cell phones to let ourselves into the building. There's a security guard that sits in the booth, but in any case, what will happen to tenants if a power outage happens and the heavily use of technology works against us? This heavily use of technology does not protect us in cases of emergency. And I fear that strangers or just about anybody will have the ability to walk in, um, will be able to walk in the premises or for tenants to be completely locked out. Just recently, we experienced a quick power outage in our area to where water and electricity was completely out. One building had no water, and the other had both no water or electricity for a full day. So it, we, had to, we had to be let in the premises by security guards because the key fobs and intercom systems were all out. After walking through the doors and passing security guards, there are cameras positioned by doors, both the front and back entry of the buildings, by the elevators, in the elevators. And as soon as you get off the elevator to walk to our apartments, yes, you guessed it, there's another camera that watches us to our, to our doors. They're in uh, we also have a maintenance crew who also secures the premises. They're indirectly put on duty to watch us since some were past security guards who were given quote unquote promotions to become part of the maintenance teams in our buildings, but some of us feel that they too watch us. If a security maintenance, excuse me, if it's a security maintenance team in our buildings, but some of us feel they too watch us. Okay, sorry. If a security guard is not sitting at the booth, a maintenance worker will be seated there. When we slip, flyers under the doors and have some that cannot be pushed fully under the doors. We are told that building maintenance are told by management to pick up the flyers that are visible and throw them away. We as residents do not feel as if though we're being protected, but merely feel like prisoners or feel like we're being tagged in our own homes or in a place or any place for that matter, we do not want this type of system. We as predominantly women, we as predominantly women and people of color already feel heavily surveilled and targeted. Often minorities Profile, profiled whether it be the color of our skin or culturally. Why should we feel this way in a place where we, we pay our rent? Let's take a look at Jimmy Gomez, a California Democrat, which uh, according to CNN, um, facial recognition is, um, has been brought about in one of the largest states and has the largest states, is one of the largest states that take action against their technology, excuse me. He's a, um, Gomez is a Harvard graduate and one of the rare Hispanic lawmakers serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. But to Amazon's facial recognition system, he resembled a possible criminal. criminal. Gomez was one of the 28 U.S. Congress members falsely matched with mugshots of people who've been arrested as part of the test the American Civil Liberties Union ran last year of Amazon recognition program. The results emphasize the increasing concern among civil liberty groups, lawmakers, tech terms, and even other tenants who live in buildings throughout the nation that facial recognition could hurt minorities as the technology becomes more conventional. The usage of the technology is now being used in iPhones and Android phones, police retailers, airports, and schools, and are gradually approaching around it too. With studies proven that facial recognition systems have a tougher time identifying women in darker skin, which could lead to frightful false positives, especially within Atlanta Plaza Tower residents, since predominantly we are all women of color living there. This is an example of how the application of technology in a residential space can cause har harmful consequences for communities who are already over surveilled. We have experienced mere disrespect and have been continuously treated like criminals in our own homes. For instance, when some of us first learned about facial recognition, tenants gathered in the lobby to discuss the use of this technology. Building management then sent the tenants who are spreading knowledge or awareness a notice to threaten us with pictures, as Ms. Anita has presented before you guys, to, um, uh, uh, sorry. The, the, the place was the lobby was not a place to solicit, electioneer, hang out, or loiter. When in fact, landlords nevertheless don't have the right to ban nonviolent and diplomatic gatherings in this way because it is our right as citizens to congregate and educate one another. Our biggest danger is that the technology begins in the hands of third party entities who will get unsolicited access to our biometric information and ultimately will be placed in damaging systems such as perpetual police lineups, as indicated by researchers at Georgetown Law School. There's a huge growing gap between existing laws and current privacy bills have not been ambitious enough to protect people, all people. I suggest we create a blueprint for future legislation. We need to consider ways to improve introduced bill proposals, including a central golden rule of privacy to ensure we can trust that our personal data is handled in ways consistent with our own interests and within the parameters in with which it is collected. High tech revolution is surpassing privacy protections. Government is now capable of collecting specifics about our private lives. For instance, in New York, police have secretly installed surveillance gear planned for conflict. And now since this flawed facial recognition technology has slowly crept into transit hubs and our schools, our government and the courts have outsourced sensitive decision making to a biased algorithm system. 
In conclusion, privacy has become a complicated concept, one that frequently changes with times and with evolving technologies. The technologies and devices one may assume as vital to modern life also keeps an extensive record of where we go, who we interact with, how we entertain ourselves, and more. As a result, we suffer the consequences and are forced, as some of us experienced over the past several years, of often corporations fail to protect our most sensitive information by receiving unknown phone calls or unwanted emails. We're often feeling like government is secretly spying on us. There are actions one can take to secure our own information, but I still feel comfortable with broader protections requiring new legislation or even reconstruction of our constitutional rights for this new digital era. Since the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures leaves substantial room for clarification. The urge for more privacy has been gaining recognition. Now the question is whether the courts, the federal government, or the states will step in to protect our privacy. Ladies and gentlemen, one must realize that we are living in a day and age with rapid advancement in modern technology to where artificial intelligence has become highly regulated by people in specific power and to those who heavily depend on it for their social media or for other urges, urges for other users, sorry. I feel it's necessary and the wisest thing to set forth by implementing newer laws against specific advanced technologies such as facial recognition in the residential area where privacy is a huge concern and not security. Ultimately, in the residential area, uh, ultimately, we the tenants of Atlanta Plaza Towers already feel safe and urge our city council to push in taking better precautions against warrantless collection of sensitive data by the government, fighting for transparency about the information government sweeps up and its techniques, and advocating for New Yorkers to cautiously take control over their personal data and who has access to it. Thank you all for your time and consideration, and I hope to hear a positive solution that makes us all happy in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Summer Katnani, and I am a deputy director at the Tenants Rights Coalition at Legal Services NYC. The Tenants Rights Coalition is at the forefront of the fight to prevent evictions, preserve affordable housing, combat harassment, and ensure that New York City tenants' are, homes are safe and in good repair. I'd like to speak today about intro number 1672 and the Keys Act. Um, we, we are watching facial recognition technology expand rapidly with no formal oversight as a new threat to housing stability. We know of at least four residential buildings where facial recognition technology has already been utilized in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens, and we continue to learn more as concerned tenants reach out to us. I will note that each of these buildings are either rent stabilized or new affordable housing construction that was regulated and sanctioned by the city and HPD. In one of those affordable housing lottery buildings in the Bronx, um, from notices that tenants have shared with us that we've reviewed, we know that as of today, they will not have any option other than to use facial recognition technology as the only means of entry. We also know that tenants had to agree to use facial recognition technology and scan their faces while signing their leases. This required exchange of a tenant's biometric data for a roof over their head is extremely troubling for a litany of reasons, many of which the tenants here have laid out. While the Keys Act provides that a landlord cannot require that a tenant use facial recognition technology, from everything we know about the relationships between landlords and tenants from our work, tenants will not have a meaningful choice to decline such use, particularly where the bill does not require informed consent. Tenants are seeking housing are in a vulnerable position, and we see time and time again that tenants are not able to assert rights or question the conditions or preferences set by landlords who are in control of the resource they desperately need. Tenants accept rent overcharges, improper fees, terrible conditions, all things that are technically illegal. And for tenants to truly understand what they are consenting to with respect to facial recognition technology, it requires significant disclosure and education, even before taking into account the wide range of education and literacy levels of tenants across the city. The council should not discount this real power imbalance and what facial recognition can mean for tenants in the city, particularly low-income tenants of color who will most acutely feel the impact of this technology. Giving a landlord control over a tenant's biometric data exacerbates an already coercive relationship. A landlord may now do any number of things with this data that will put a tenant at risk. A landlord may share the data with law enforcement agencies, as many people have said, use it in eviction proceedings, or use it to harass, um, harass tenants in order to drive them out, or as they, that not even facial recognition technology, but other surveillance technology has already tried to attempt to stop tenants from organizing and to assert their rights. 
Equally troubling will be the ability of the landlord to profit off of its tenant's biometric data, either by selling it post-collection to a third party or by some arrangement with the technology vendor who will reap tremendous monetary benefit from access to a large data set of faces here in these buildings in New York, black and brown faces, to test and train its systems. Further, the error rate of facial technology is significantly higher for people of color, making the chances of discrimination, police profiling, and false arrests and accusations higher. Lack of accuracy also means tenants of color will be more readily susceptible to be locked out of their homes. In addition, the risk and harm from possible data breaches will fail, fall more readily on tenants of color, for whom identity theft is already a very real and serious threat to people's ability to recover. Though the irreplaceable nature of biometric identifiers, your face is one of them, makes the compromises of this data a severe privacy and security threat to all city tenants. Landlords are not properly equipped, nor are they required under the bills to secure this extremely sensitive data. If the commercial industry has already faced a number of data breaches, landlords certainly are not going to do better. And the city agencies here today are already suggested they're not in a position to actually monitor or enforce the bills that are on the table. These bills sanction landlords' collection of biometric data, creating a situation where city tenants must turn over this unique identifying information to a private actor in order to obtain or retain a home. There is no need or justification for this in the residential context. We agree with the Atlantic Plaza Tower tenants that an outright ban of facial recognition in, in residences would best protect Legal Services NYC clients, population, and all tenants, and which is currently the, the bills that are pending in the state Assembly and Senate. However, should the Council decide to move forward with legislation permitting the use of such technology by landlords, we have included a list of suggested measures in our written testimony that could mitigate some of the potential risks and harms that tenants will face and make the bill str much stronger legislative tools for advancing racial and housing justice across the city. Though, it sounds like passing these measures will take time. And with all the areas that will remain unregulated that Council Member Lander raised earlier, to allow the use of this technology while these issues get resolved is concerning. We agree also with Atlantic Plaza Tower tenants that a moratorium on use in the residential context until these issues can be resolved is prudent. We thank you for the opportunity to give feedback on these bills and we'd ha be happy to respond to any questions the Council may have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh Councilmember Cornicky, question. Yeah, so it's just a, a, a basic question to the entire panel. I'm not sure whether uh, there's opposition to the technology or opposition to the use of the technology and how it could disproportionately negatively impact communities of color. Um, because as, as, as part of you know, a responsibility it is to adapt to and compete globally on a world stage. And I'm just wondering if it's, if it's the technology that is obviously scary as we go into the technology, or is it the use of the technology in a way that disproportionately negative, could ne disproportionately negatively impact, in particular, communities of color and tenants of color and black women? Um, personally, uh, just on behalf of the tenants in front of me, we'd like to say it's a risk to us on both sides, just for the simple fact that what we're talking about in terms of the technology that we're dealing with currently, it's not at a point, and you could see from the validation studies done with, with you know, valid research from data scientists that, are more ex, that are, have more expertise than me, the margin of error along the current technology that's within this facet of society, of, of understanding facial recognition technology and biometrics period, it's not ready to be able to be implemented on communities or, or the residential circuit period, both public and private housing. We're taking too much of a risk with this large margin of error, especially on those of color and those who are women, um, to try a test pool of this technology to see if it works or not. We're not at a point 
amongst even the tech giants who are the forerunners of this technology, they themselves can't even handle the margin of error that comes with this technology. So to try to implement it within society and not do the rightful testing to make sure that this is foolproof, it's almost as though you're putting in a half sawed off key and giving that to tenants to say, hey, you can use this, knowing that the, ha that the key might not open the door all the time. Now, just because it's convenient doesn't mean that it's effective. And all I'm, and all I'm saying and all, my ten, and all the tenants that are with me today are going to constantly be saying is that this technology is not effective, especially within the residential circuit. And all you're going to give us is more problems to have to deal with than what we already currently have. Can I just reiterate one thing along this? It wasn't the tenants that said they needed more security. It was the landlords that were proposing this technology on the, com on the communities among them. Everyone that you've heard that are local community advocates or people who come from these living complexes, they never said security was on the top of their list of concerns. So I say both the technology and the use of the technology is that of which we're not comfortable with and we do not want to have any interaction with because that wasn't one of our concerns to begin with. The only reason why we're here is because the technology was imposed on us. So now we're stuck here having to oppose and be defensive towards this technology. We didn't ask for this in the first place. I have many other concerns as a tenant within my housing complex. Security was not one of them. Knowing that I have uh, cameras that are literally doing 24 seven feeds on where I live within the hallways, knowing that only the staircase in my apartment is the only place that doesn't have a camera, and knowing that I have key fob technology that tracks my every movement, whether of when and where I come inside the, uh, the apartment complex that, uh, for which I live, I already feel like I'm well enough surveilled, and I kind of feel like a criminal even though I pay my rent just like the next person. I kind of feel like there's a stigma against rent stabilization, and I get it. There's a lot of legalese that's gonna be within this room, and a lot of people can't talk about it, but I wanna bring it up, the fact that this legalese just feels like we're constantly touching an underlying issue of the fact that Residents who are of rent stabilized apartments and building complexes, they feel like they're at risk because they have to deal with landlords imposing this technology on them. You don't see this in the more popular, the more, um, the higher, the higher costing apartments within New York. The first places at which this technology is being implemented and that of which at the stage it's being imposed upon, it's very faulty it's being imposed on people who can't afford to have a voice to say, hey, I don't think this is right for me nor us, and I think we should look into this. And I'm coming to you today to make sure that you at least understand that I get that this isn't as personal to you all just because you may not live in the complexes that might be dealing with this technology, but I'm kind of tired of having for these sort of situations having to be personal in order for people to be mindful of the risk involved. I'd rather people be preeminent about the risk involved, just the way landlords are being preeminent about um, integrating technology that we didn't ask for in the first place. That's all. Yeah. Uh, actually, though, I, I really appreciate that, but thank you. It, sometimes it's better for us to be able to put a face. So I know you don't want to make it personal, but to be able to put a face and an experience to, to legislation that we're proposing, right? Because there's and, and just the reason that I asked is because as a, as a obviously as a black man who represents Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, who is acutely aware that a lot of times technology and or products reach our communities at the end of their li product life cycle, that's concerning for me. So when there's an opportunity for some, maybe not in this case, uh, products and or services to introduce themselves in the early stages, I'm acutely aware that we're, 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 we're capable as communities of color to be able to participate. This may not be one of those times, but for me, I'm sick of watching products and services be introduced into our communities at the end of their product life cycle. So that, that's, why, that's why I asked. And, and council member, if I can add to, to that, I think this is the product you do not want to be at the beginning of the life cycle. And I think somebody mentioned earlier that Google was paying people off the street $5 in order to scan their faces. And so the accuracy and bias of these products, they should not be allowed to be unleashed in the residential context, 
in New York City and affordable housing um, at this time because the reason we believe could, they could be being put in these buildings is because companies have a really hard time accessing darker faces for their algorithms. And so this is, as uh, one of the AI experts that we've worked with has called it, it's called it data mining. And it's almost like involuntary servitude of using a part of, of the tenant's body, right, their biometric data, in order to improve their systems, in order to train the algorithm and to make it better. So perhaps putting these systems in these buildings would, make, would improve the accuracy of the systems, but that shouldn't be at the expense of the tenants who are living there, and it should not be for the profit of the landlords or the, in the companies without any benefit to the tenants. And so, you know, this is extremely troubling to us that we, we see as part of the motivation for the installation of these technologies here is because of, right, in Atlantic Towers alone, you have over a thousand faces, right? More than that, probably closer to three to five thousand faces that can be scanned and, and integrated into an algorithm. Thank you for that context. I appreciate it. Councilman Lander. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys all for coming out today and really becoming leaders on this. I'm sorry that it was imposed on you and that you had to do it, but that you have taken that to become leaders for the city is, is great. And I'll be honest, the, you know, the kind of people I think the public might have in their head as uh, privacy advocates you know, it's probably more likely like young white millennials than, than you guys. And that doesn't fit with the fact that actually, you know, the evidence is clear that surveillance technologies disproportionately impact people of color. So I just want to start by, you know, uh, appreciating your being here, respecting your leadership. And, you know, it's because I met Ms. Icy at a Mitchell Lama tenants meeting that I went ahead and put in the drafting request for this bill. So, you know, I did have the chance, at least to some extent, to speak with tenants, and it's from your experience that this legislation is coming forward, which is not to say it's yet as strong as we want it to be, um, and that there's not ways we can make it stronger, so we appreciate your input. But it, it is your leadership that got this bill introduced into the, into the council and is pushing this conversation forward. Um, and I, I really support the idea of going further, of banning facial recognition technology and of figuring out how to get that golden rule of privacy that you mentioned. Um, I guess I do want to ask, you know, I think the, you know, coming up with the golden rule of privacy is going gonna, is gonna to be some work. Um, I think the inclination behind the Keys Act was, let, you know, let's move forward and, and work toward a bigger, stronger ban, but in the meantime, let's at least make sure everybody has a physical key so they don't, aren't required to be subjected to that technology. And it, it isn't yet the case that that rule is clearly in place. Um, and so that's where the idea of this law would be so that the HPD and the Department of Buildings tenants themselves could enforce their right not to be subjected to the technology and to get the keys. So, so that's you know, why we're here. And, and I hear you for a desire for a moratorium. I agree with you for a, for a ban and for stronger privacy protections. Um, but I guess I want to just you know, like ask you the real practical question, you know, and, and we'll talk more after this as well, sort of in the meantime, uh, till we can get that bigger, broader prohibition uh, or set of restrictions in place. Um, does it seem like it would be useful to make sure that everybody at Atlantic Plaza and every other tenant in the city at least had that right to a physical key and not to be required to subject themselves? And we'll look in the suggestions you've made for how we might make it even stronger, address these issues of informed consent. But. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the attorney, have you, do you know of anybody that's been evicted based on facial re uh, recognition or technology? We are not aware of any like thing like that yet. Um, Knickerbocker is the longest standing building that's used facial recognition, so we don't know if any of that data was used to evict tenants. We do know that other surveillance uh, technology such as video footage, um, and I think even key fob footage has been used by landlords as evidence of comings and goings and where somebody is at a certain time and non-primary residence and, and things like that. So. For us, if, if the other kinds of surveillance technology have been used, uh, it's likely this technology will be used as well. And in this case, right, like I, I believe um, another speaker had said, right, if you're using video surveillance technology to build a case against a tenant, 
you have to sit and watch hours and hours and days and days and days of, of video in order to prove, and we've watched hours and hours of video before to prove that, um, that our clients actually in fact live in the building. Um, but here, you'd be able to just really easily from, so the, the ability of a landlord to use this data for eviction will be much more readily available. Um, but this technology is really nascent, I mean, it's nascent even in the buildings where it's been uh, utilized, it's only been a matter of, I don't even think a year, so. Thank you all for your excellent testimony. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right. Our final panel, uh, Daniel Schwartz, Zach Steinberg, uh, Sky Duveen, Vincent Sutherland, and Laura Heck Feli? Feli? I, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs>
what they collect for video, and I don't know why they should be collecting any video whatsoever in the first place, but they include audio as ambient noise in a category which they can share indiscriminately with third parties and store indefinitely. New Yorkers should be secure in our public space and we the people should set the terms for our identity being tracked rather than let the companies write their own loopholes. One last thing I wanted to discuss uh, that the council has asked some other folks testifying today uh, besides the possible harms that have already been brought about, are credit scores, loan approvals, uh, and advertisements for opportunities. Uh, these have been used uh, based on, for instance, your Facebook friends uh, have changed what loan approvals or credit scores or whatever. And uh, they could just as easily uh, use uh, who I walk down the street with who visits me in my apartment uh, with you know, my key fob or somebody else. And um, we shouldn't wait until you know, that becomes public. It's probably already happening in some ways. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Vincent Sutherland. I'm the executive director of the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law at NYU School of Law. Um, I want to thank the Joint Committee for providing us with the opportunity to testify this afternoon. In the course of our work, the Center, among other things, has frequently provided commentary and guidance regarding specific technologies with a focus on racial justice implications of those technologies across a number of domains. Our comments here are driven by the concerns raised by these technologies, specifically their ability to either perpetuate or, or further um, reify racism and inequality in our society. As always, we are also informed by the lives and experiences of people and communities of color who are disproportionately subjected to the harmful use of technological tools. Indeed, my comments and testimony are largely informed by the experiences of the residents of Atlantic Towers who are waging a battle to stop the use of this technology in their homes and who I met um, in my role as a member of the ADS task force um, that the city is, is currently uh, convened. It's with that in mind that I recommend an outright ban on the use of facial recognition technology in residential spaces. I believe in light of the potential harms caused by this technology, the potential for abuse that it presents, and the absence of any appreciable or negligible benefits to be gained by its use, that a ban is appropriate. We appreciate the vast possibilities that technological innovation holds for improving human life in our society. With those promises come perils. Technology itself does not inevitably foster prog progress. It is simply a tool that can be wielded for many different purposes, including harmful ends. The hands in which those tools are held often determines how those harms are felt and who bears the, burden, the, the disproportionate burden of them. Experience tells us that the consequences of facial recognition technology clearly outweigh its benefits. That experience is largely informed by an understanding that black and Latinx and poor and working class New Yorkers will unequally bear all the most extreme burdens if New York City continues to permit the use of facial recognition technologies in a manner contemplated by the proposed legislation. We come to our position for three principal reasons. First. As detailed in a written submission, these technologies lead to increased surveillance of communities of color, which are already the disproportionate targets of unjustified law enforcement surveillance. Second, because of that potential and in many ways inevitable misuse of surveillance data. There are already many well-documented horrors associated with facial recognition technology across the world, from the United States to China, including the NYPD's documented abuse of facial recognition technology against children over the last four years and China's use of it to engage in racial profiling. One can easily imagine tools such as these or the data that they produce being turned over to the state and, and federal law enforcement agencies, particularly in our current political climate where efforts are undertaken to identify and root out those among us who the government insists do not belong. Do we really trust HUD and ICE and any other federal government agency in, in this current uh, legal regime to do what is right and morally defensible vis-a-vis -vis this technology, or even landlords for that matter? Third, um, because, facial recognition, excuse me, because facial recognition technologies are broken, they have racial uh, discrimination baked into the algorithms and data sets that drive their operation. The pervasive nature of racism and gender bias in this world means that the raw materials used to build these tools and the technologists who build them simply do not and cannot fully account for race and gender. Their training data sets are missing entire swaths of the population and therefore producing faulty results, the very definition of garbage in, garbage out. In the residential context, the introduction of this technology creates a two-tiered race-based system of egress and access to one's home a system in which white people encounter few hurdles to accessing their buildings using facial recognition technologies, while black or brown people are often left to grapple with the race-based flaws endemic to the technology itself. 
We don't raise this concern to encourage improvements to the design of these technologies, but rather to highlight another way in which facial recognition technologies foster racial inequality and why New York City should ban them. While I support the, the, the proposed legislation, I respectively, respectfully submit that while well intended, it's a retail solution to a wholesale problem. We detail our concerns with the proposed provisions in our written testimony, so we'll not belabor them here. However, the, the basic point is that they all revolve around one simple fact, that the law is insufficient at this point to guard against the abuses that this technology will inevitably foster. Ultimately, facial recognition technology is being used to determine who and who, who, does, who does and does not belong. The racial bias that is baked into these tools itself is a signal to New Yorkers about who that actually is. As the abuses outlined in, throughout the, today's hearing and at the outset of my comments make clear, this technology has already been deployed by those who have used it to marginalize and oppress communities of color and vulnerable populations. We know that the negative impacts of the facial recognition technology is like it far outweigh any purported benefits. We also know that people figured out how to build safe, healthy, and thriving communities without surveilling one another for generations that existed before this technology ever came along. Let's not mistake safe, safety for surveillance, understand that reality, and take steps to ban its use in residential spaces. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, council members, uh, Chairman Cornegy and Chairman Holden. My name is Laura hecht Falella, and I am a legal fellow with the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. I have prepared longer written remarks, um, and will just present a short summary here. The Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that seeks to improve our systems of democracy and justice. The Liberty and National Security Program, in particular, focuses on ensuring that government use of new technologies does not violate fundamental rights. The Brennan Center commends the City Council on its commitment to addressing the growing prevalence of biometric identification technology in New York City. However, we must also express our disappointment that this commitment has not resulted in oversight of the New York City Police Department. Meaningful efforts by the City Council to increase transparency of these technologies must include law enforcement. The NYPD's expansive arsenal of surveillance technology includes several biometric tools like facial recognition, video analytics, which isolate people and objects within videos, and DNA databases. Attached to my testimony is a chart that the Brennan Center published this morning. It outlines the scope of the NYPD surveillance capabilities and several technologies for which the NYPD has failed to provide even basic information about what safeguards, if any, exist to protect New Yorkers' privacy and civil rights. This is especially concerning because, as the Council has heard this morning, tools like facial recognition are significantly less reliable when it comes to identifying communities of color, but oftentimes this is exactly where the technology is being utilized. One step forward in addressing these concerns is the POST Act which would require the NYPD to disclose basic information about the surveillance tools it uses and the safeguards in place to protect the privacy and civil liberties of New Yorkers. The bill is supported by over half the City Council with 28 co-sponsors, including some of you in this room today um, and who were here previously, and is carefully drafted to ensure that the NYPD can, con can continue to keep the city safe while providing policymakers and the public with the information necessary for effective oversight. Several cities have passed far more stringent bills, as was brought up earlier today as well. Transparency and oversight are essential features of a strong democracy, and the Brennan Center commends the City Council for addressing these critical and timely issues. However, it's vital that any legislation requiring transparency also applies to law enforcement, which is why the Post Act is so important. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. My name is Daniel Schwartz, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union. We thank the three chairpersons and council members for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Biometric surveillance, and specifically face surveillance, is on the verge of becoming a widespread reality in New York City, in businesses, places of entertainment, housing, schools, airports, mass transit, public road infrastructure, and by law enforcement agencies. Face surveillance allows for the pervasive tracking of individuals' movements, interests, habits, and associations and it has repeatedly been proven to perform less accurately on people of color, pe uh, women, and young people. We are heartened to see the Council beginning to tackle facial recognition and biometric data collection. Unfortunately, none of these bills go far enough in regulating and curtailing the technologies. Moreover, if passed as drafted, they could normalize biometric recognition technologies and create a clearer path for its broad deployment in our homes, businesses, and streets 
effectively eroding our freedoms and exacerbating bias and discrimination. This year, San Francisco, Oakland, and Somerville, Massachusetts all recognized the unique threats and passed bans on government use of failed surveillance. As is evident, New York City, despite its immense population and resources, falls far behind in ensuring its public policy meets the threats of surveillance. While these bills are a positive step that this council recognizes the need for legislation in the face of this new technology, none of them go far enough. First, the NYCLU takes a position of qualified support on intro 1170. As currently drafted, the legislation defines biometric identifiers narrowly. For example, as drafted, the definition excludes several biometric identifiers, such as gait and ear recognition, both of which are already in use. We urge the Council to define biometric identifiers broadly and in a tech-agnostic way. Second, the bill should be amended to cover not only situations where the system ties the aggregated data to a particular individual's names, but also to situations where the system profiles an individual pseudonymously. We further urge the sponsor to amend the legislation to include other uses of biometric recognition and analytics that create data on people, including gender and age estimation, automatic labeling or classification, emotion recognition, and behavior detection. Finally, given the highly sensitive information, additional security duties should be placed on commercial entities operating surveillance systems. Biometric recognition should not be deployed without serious considerations for individuals' private data and how to safeguard them. The NYCLU opposes intro 1672 because it would entrench face surveillance and other biometric recognition tools in housing, an area of already highly imbalanced power relationship between tenants and landlords. The imposition of a biometric identification access system conditions entry into one's home, the place where constitutional rights are most robust, on the provision of one's most sensitive biological data. And because facial recognition systems are notoriously inaccurate when it comes to women, children, and people of color, entrenching biometric identification access systems render these groups particularly vulnerable. Thus, not only would these systems undermine tenants' privacy rights, but these systems also undermine their civil rights to access housing on equal and non-discriminatory terms. The NYCLU supports pre-considered introduction T2019-4579. We are encouraged by the council member taking up the issue to protect the privacy rights of tenants in their ho homes and offer our support for the enactment of the bill. However, despite its good intentions, the bill does not sufficiently protect tenants from all invasive access con te control technologies. Consequently, this bill should be amended to include the many safeguards described in our written response to intro 1672 when landlords do choose to impose automated technologies and the council should consider whether particularly invasive biometric technologies are ever appropriate in the housing context. Finally, pass the Public Oversight Over Surveillance Technology Act or POST Act, intro 487-2018. As we have outlined and as the measures before the committees today recognize, the use of face surveillance and other forms of biometric recognition technology presents serious threats to the privacy rights of New Yorkers in their homes and in places of business. Beyond these specific threats, however, is the threat posed to the Fourth Amendment rights of New Yorkers should law enforcement seek access to the vast amounts of data that these technologies generate. Landlords and business owners who deploy biometric recognition technology may inadvertently be creating databases that pre present enticing uh, targets for the NYPD to access. The POST Act will bring much needed transparency and oversight to the N NYPD's use of invasive surveillance technologies and the ways in which the NYPD amasses and shares surveillance data with other public and private entities. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent testimony. Uh, any questions? We're good? Okay, thank you, panel. Great, great testimony. Again, once again, great panels today. Uh, anybody else would like to testify? Hearing none? Okay, nobody? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much for your testimony, and the hearing's adjourned.